Hi, listeners. This is the 80,000 Hours Podcast, where each week we have an unusually in-depth conversation about the world's most pressing problems and how you can use your career to solve them. I'm Rob Wibland, Director of Research at 80,000 Hours. I was recently going through our podcast analytics to see where people are listening to the show. A lot of it is about what you'd expect. So 45% of listeners are, are in the US, and there's a large number from the UK, Canada, and Australia. But I was interested to see how popular we are in Germany, Sweden, and the Netherlands, which uh, make up the next three. Hello, Loita. Hey, Alehoppe. And hello, Aiden. I hope I got that right. Not sure. Also, here's a shout out to our lone listener in each of East Timor, Cuba, and the Faroe Islands. I hope you're finding the show useful wherever in the world you find yourself. At the end of the episode, I read a short blog post we recently published about US government policy careers for people with a scientific background. Let me know whether you'd like me to regularly read relevant articles at the end of the show by emailing podcast at 80,000hours.org. I'm not sure where we want to go with these audio recordings of articles, but I thought it was worth giving a go. And if you're aware of a community that really should know about the information in this episode, please do share it with them. That could include a subreddit, a Facebook group, or perhaps a mailing list. In today's episode, I speak with Daniel Ellsberg, who will be known to many listeners already. Daniel studied economics at Harvard before becoming a commissioned officer in the U.S. Marine Corps. He then went to work at the RAND Corporation, a non-profit think tank working for the U.S. government, concentrating on nuclear strategy and the command and control of nuclear weapons. In the early 60s, he finished a PhD in economics at Harvard, focused on decision-making under uncertainty and ambiguity, in which he discussed a problem now known as the Ellsberg Paradox. From 1964, he worked at the Pentagon under Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara, advising on American strategy in the Vietnam War, and spent two years doing research in South Vietnam itself. He became progressively disaffected with the war, and after failing to find a way to affect the war inside the government, in 1971, he leaked thousands of pages of analysis about the US's grim prospects in Vietnam to dozens of newspapers. Those documents subsequently became known as the Pentagon Papers, and were an enormous scandal with the public tiring of the war. They exposed the government's poor decision-making and widespread lying to the public, and ended up being one of the most consequential leaks in US history. Ellsberg was charged for revealing classified information and faced life in prison. In an attempt to discredit and blackmail him, government agents broke into his psychiatrist's office in order to steal his medical records, and his phone was tapped without a warrant. Ultimately, he was freed on a mistrial due to this and other criminal behaviour on the part of prosecutors. The ability to link this criminal activity directly to Nixon, along with the evidence from the break-in at the Watergate Hotel, would end the Nixon presidency soon after. He wrote his memoirs about Vietnam, Secrets, in 2002, and last year published The Doomsday Machine, Confessions of a Nuclear War Planner, which is the main topic of our discussion today. I hope you enjoy this episode. So thanks for coming on the podcast, Daniel. Thank you. Good to be here. Uh, So while my intro was mostly about the Pentagon Papers, uh, today I want to focus mostly on the topic of your latest book, The Doomsday Machine, The Threat of Nuclear Apocalypse uh, and How to Prevent It, as I think that that's been less covered in, in previous interviews that you've done. First, though, what are you working on these days and why do you think it's important? Well, the paperback edition of The Doomsday Machine, Confessions of a Nuclear War Planner, is coming out by Bloomsbury a year after the hardback. So it'll be coming out in early December, December 5th this year. And so I'm really preparing for that, uh, in part by planning to put things on the web that I thought were left out of the book that I'd like people to know. And uh, also involved in archiving my files altogether, I'm working with someone who is digitalizing, in principle, all my files. Though, you know, for one person, it's uh, very hard to do that. It's sort of like shoveling the sea. <laughs> <laughs> but I am working on that and trying to keep up with current events and how the revelations in the doomsday machine apply to current events. So I continue to be hopeful to try to prevent nuclear war. Yeah. Has there been much interest in uh, the book from policy? Yeah, actually, uh, the the publishers have been happily surprised. 17 publishers turned down the book uh, before Bloomsbury took it on the grounds that it, they couldn't sell it for commercial reasons. They said they respected me, but this was not a subject they could sell. Actually, um, although the first printing was uh, only 19,000, they have now sold in, in about six months uh, somewhat more than 40,000, which unfortunately doesn't make it a bestseller yet, uh, yeah. not viral or anything. I wish it were. But um, it's it's uh, respectable for 
a book of that nature. It's respectable is not what I was aiming at in the <laughs> sense that I, I really would like to change discussion and climate on this. It's gotten very good reviews, actually, yeah. virtually all of them. Two rather lukewarm reviews, all the other are very, uh, very warm. And uh, I couldn't ask, for actually, for better, better reviews. And I've been talking, doing quite a bit of speaking and interviewing in connection with it. So the book does do what one hopes is to give you a platform for speaking about a subject that's very important to me. Yeah. Have you heard from anyone in the military or intelligence services? No, I no. didn't expect they, 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 to hear they, don't, they don't take your calls. I'd love it if they were reading it. I, I would love nothing better to have it read. Yeah. In fact, uh, to show what I can aim at here, I have was speaking just yesterday, it so happens, to a Marine general, mm-hmm. I won't identify him, who is anxious to read it, and I'm going to send that to him today. But the thought occurred to me that he's in a position to send it to General Marine, General Dunford, who's chairman of the Joint Chiefs, uh, to General James Mattis, who's the Secretary of Defense, and to General Kelly, who is the Chief of Staff, all of whom were junior officers under this very general. <laughs> so if he orders them to read it, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's, 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 it's actually conceivable. Uh, I already had some hope from the fact that Marines are in such prominent positions because Marines have had no real connection with nuclear weapons for a long time. Uh, Going way back into the early 50s, they had a 10-inch howitzer shell, uh, which actually um, they sent 10-inch howitzers into Lebanon in the landing in 1958. And there was a question whether the shells had accompanied them or not, never, never resolved. But the Marines were dispossessed of their nuclear weapons half a century ago, And as a result, I think these people, although they've been to war colleges, of course, and have very broad responsibilities now, I suspect they are not as devoted to Mm. even the threat of nuclear weapons as the Air Force and Navy. And even the Army used to be. The Army, too, has lost its nuclear weapons, like the Marines. But uh, that's encouraging to me. I think now there's never been a time when Marines were in such prominent policy positions. Mm. They're sort of the uh, the fifth leg on the, you know, the military. <laughs> so uh, I think there actually is some promise there, I'm hoping. Yeah. So what do you think are the few most important points in, in the book that you'd really want people to remember? Well, that our policy has actually been the threat of an insane action, an action that essentially we now know for the last 35 years has involved killing nearly everyone on Earth by the smoke from the burning cities that are planned to be hit in our war plans. And that smoke, we now know on the nuclear winter calculations, would be lofted into the stratosphere, would spread around the world globally. I'm talking now about a war between the U.S. and Russia where thousands of weapons would be involved. And a few hundred of those weapons on cities, which are targeted, uh, would be enough to cause smoke that would reduce the sunlight reaching the Earth's surface by about 70%, killing all the harvests worldwide, and for a period as long as a decade. But that wouldn't be necessary. Uh, Killing all the harvests for about a year, or even less, uh, would would exhaust our food supplies, which globally are about 60 days, and nearly everyone would starve to death, except for a small fraction, perhaps 1%, a little more or less, of humans would survive in Australia or New Zealand, southern hemisphere is somewhat less affected, eating fish and mollusks. And that could be a sizable number of people. 1% is 70 million people, but 99% gone, and virtually all the larger animals other than humans. They're not as adaptable as we are, and um, they can't move thousands of miles and wear clothes like fires, have houses. They would go extinct altogether, as they did when an asteroid hit the Earth 60 seven or 65 million years ago, and created a very similar effect, blotting out sunlight by the dust that was sent up. So the war plans of both the U.S. and Russia have contemplated as a uh, sending not, not just hundreds, but thousands of warheads at each other and hitting hundreds of cities. And something between 100 and 200 cities hit that way by thermonuclear weapons would cause this nuclear winter. The likelihood of a limited nuclear war between the U.S. and Russia is not quite zero, but it's very small. Uh, any, any armed conflict between U.S. and Russia, which has never occurred yet, would, uh, would bear a high likelihood or a real, a real risk of uh, erupting and escalating into the use of nuclear weapons by one or the other. And once that happened, the chance 
of keeping it limited is very low. Each would worry that the other was about to escalate. And another major point in the book is that our planning on both sides has been aimed delusionally for this entire period at limiting damage to one's own side by counterforce, by hitting the forces of the other side in addition to its cities and its urban industrial centers. In fact, most of the targets on both sides are of military targets, many of them near cities or in the cities, actually. But for over half a century, the idea that that would, in effect, protect the attacking side from close to annihilation or certainly the destruction of its society has been delusional. The um, likelihood is that the society would be entirely destroyed. And I come back to the point that the threat of initiating such a war has been aimed at deterring the other side from various actions, aggressive actions of various kinds, Uh, And yet it is the threat of an insane action. And to call it immoral is scarcely conveyed by any word at our disposal. Immoral, you know, that can link from anything. It's like stealing a pack of gum. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, And uh, even the word evil seems uh, just overwhelmed by what we're talking about, which is the destruction of most large life and most humans on Earth. Something that was simply not possible hundred years ago, or for that matter, 80 years ago. Uh, So we don't have concepts to deal with it, ethical, legal, practical. We've been living with it and making the kinds of threats that have been used for millennia to intimidate and influence uh, policies of other countries, but uh, on a scale that was never before possible or contemplated. So I'd say we're in a situation then where such a war can actually occur. It has been prepared for more extensively probably than any other human project in history. Go back to uh, the original Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the first acts, the first nuclear war. That involved a combination of the two most elaborate, highly developed scientific applications the world had ever seen. The B-29 bomber was an incredibly complex, highly advanced, you know, flying machine. And, of course, the atomic weapon, the fission weapon, which they dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, represented the product of years of work of of the richest nation concentrating on this subject with the best scientific minds in the world working on it, or some of the best. There were a few comparable ones in Germany, but they didn't focus on that problem. They didn't think it was feasible in time. So here you had the two most highly developed scientific objects, the B-29 and the atomic bomb connected. Well, that fission bomb is now the trigger for a thermonuclear weapon. An H-bomb or a fusion weapon, hydrogen weapon, known as an H-bomb, uses a Nagasaki-type fission bomb as its trigger. It's detonator, it's percussion cap, in effect. And the initial explosion of a weaponized uh, kind of um, H-bomb in 1954 had an explosive yield a thousand times that of the Nagasaki weapon, a thousand times. And that, in turn, was a thousand or two thousand or four thousand times the largest bombs of World War II, which ranged from blockbusters from five to 20 tons. The Nagasaki weapon had a yield of 20,000 tons of TNT equivalent. So uh, that was a 1,000 times. And then the weapon in 1954, the Castle Bravo acronym test, was 15 megatons and uh, another 1,000, factor of 1,000. So here we have something then that nothing in history, not the pyramids, not anything else, the Great Wall of China, uh, reflected perhaps more manpower somehow over time. But in terms of science and um, part of the GNP and everything else, this will have been enormously well prepared for, you know, reflectively, rationally, scientifically, economically. And yet the result will have been the destruction of civilization altogether. It's as if uh, if one were to hypothesize somehow a self-destructive impulse in civilization or in rationality or in humans... It would be very hard to dis- to uh, disprove that, <laughs> you know, let's just say. You can think of other hypotheses, and one does, I have, how you get there without uh, having intended it altogether. No president of either country has ever intended or determined or decided to wipe out life on Earth. But they have all been willing to threaten it and to prepare for it. And the threats actually do create the risk of its happening because to make them credible and effective, 
not effective altruism, but effective intimidation, they prepared for it. They made it possible, feasible, mostly. Sometimes they make threats that are totally hollow and they can't carry out. A very important example of that was Khrushchev, the Soviet premier in the late 50s, when he was threatening Britain and London, uh, and London and Paris, with weapons that he didn't have. <laughs> he didn't have the intermediate range missile weapons at that time. But within a few years, he did have them. And having, since his threats didn't work, by the way, he decided he needed, and his military decided they needed them to be more realistic, more credible, and that meant making them feasible. And of course, making them feasible opened the possibility that deliberately or not, they would be carried out by someone or other, if not the prime minister or premier or general secretary, by someone else who had access to those weapons. It was true on the U.S. side, this is another revelation in the book, that in order to make it impossible to paralyze our response, our retaliation, by a single weapon on Washington or on our command posts, a few weapons on command posts, the authority to initiate or to, to use the weapons, the U.S. weapons, had been delegated by President Eisenhower to a number of high-level commanders who had in turn delegated it for the same reason, to their lower commanders. If their lower ones were out of communication, which happened every day in those days for technical reasons, that was before we had a big system of satellites, and um, uh, the uh, Washington was out of communication with our headquarters in Oahu part of every day. And that's not true now. It does depend on satellites, by the way, which both sides are working on anti-satellite weapons to clear the air, the space, of those connecting nodes so that really very early in a war, the weapons may well, or you could even say probably, will be out of contact with central headquarters. And it will depend then on human responses and decisions what to do in an environment in which nuclear weapons are going off and a war is on. So the idea of controlling that and limiting it to a small exchange is very low, uh, and it doesn't take much to destroy the societies. So there's a few of the things, as I say, the, the delegation, the, uh, the reliance on incredibly evil actions, which can in fact be triggered and have come close to being triggered a number of times in the past in order to have certain political effects. And this is something not in the book as much as it should be, if at all. And that is in order for corporations to sell weapons to the government and to our allies. That may actually be the main purpose. In our political economy, the military budget involves profits, jobs, political donations, careers for retired officers, uh, in and out, actually, people from the corporations and the government, uh, a great many short-run material benefits, in other words, from producing this doomsday machine. And that is true in the Russia as well. Even before, even under communism, uh, they, their desire to match what the U.S. had led them to build a doomsday machine in the mid-60s, perhaps 10 years after we did. And uh, now they have the same profit motives our corporations do. They have their equivalent to Boeing and Lockheed and Raytheon. And uh, as Gorbachev said to someone recently, you have your profit motives and we do too. So... Um, that alone is enough, actually, to ensure that these weapons get made. And when they're made and deployed and used in, quote, diplomacy, that is, threats, intimidation, the chance of their actually exploding is not zero, as it should be. So we've been maintaining in the, uh, with the rationale of deterrence and of preventing war, which may have worked in a number of cases, actually prevented wars that might have occurred otherwise. But at the same time, maintaining the risk of the destruction of civilization. And uh, we've been consciously, deliberately, rationally maintaining that risk now for well over half a century. We'll return to the political economy issue in a minute when we're thinking about what can be done. But I'm curious to know, uh, what do you think is, is the greatest uh, risk that we face in terms of which countries do you think uh, might end up shooting at one another? And uh, do you think it would be deliberate or, or a mistake? I think the greatest individual risk is a false alarm of the kind we've had repeatedly in the past, recently in a limited form in Hawaii this very year, where uh, someone put out an alert to the residents of Hawaii that an attack was on the way. Now, the residents of Hawaii were not in a position to respond or to do anything really effective. They sat in bathtubs, they went under manhole covers, none of which would have done much good. But similar false warnings have reached the highest levels. 
Very few actually up to the president. Although in 1995, President Yeltsin of Russia, after the Cold War, was told uh, that an attack was on the way and uh, was contemplating responding to it with his so-called briefcase, the, with his computer, could have led to a full-scale response. But in most cases, the fact that it's a false alarm, which took 38 minutes to discover in Hawaii, by the way, uh, is discovered by the elaborate national networks sooner than that, within a matter of minutes, often just before it was time to tell the president that it was up to him to respond. And here's the, the real danger. Not only do our warning systems on both sides bring out these false alarms, having, by the way, not just uh, casually, but uh, having gone through several filtering systems that are designed to eliminate false alarms and to explain them otherwise and so forth, nevertheless, uh, a number of, of very serious false alarms have occurred. The biggest problem is that both Russia and the U.S. have large numbers of forces, ICBMs, intercontinental ballistic missiles, that cannot survive an enemy attack on the U.S. or on Russia. They are fixed targets, uh, vulnerable to the accurate large-yield weapons on the other side. And if you wait for that alarm to be confirmed by actual explosions, the weapons themselves will mostly be destroyed. So each side has a very strong incentive and plan and readiness to launch its weapons before they are destroyed. That may be while the others are in the air or space, or if there's an indication that there will be an escalation shortly, the impulse to use them or lose them is very strong. Now, a realistic point of view would be that there is no advantage in using them over losing them because in both sides, there's enough submarine missiles that cannot be targeted that each can destroy the other, even if it's lost all of its ICBMs and its bombers, for that matter. It so happens that the Russian subs are much more vulnerable than ours because for geographic reasons and various reasons, we're able to track them from their ports or from certain entry points into the Atlantic or the Pacific in a way that they can't track ours. And we have hunter-killer submarines that are dedicated to getting a number of their submarines. The Russians really don't have a comparable capability. That doesn't mean we have a high chance of getting all of them. And a single submarine, let alone two or three, uh, would have the capability to destroy our society and bring about nuclear winter, by the way. So if the word came to the president, as it almost did in 1979 in particular, where the uh, our national security assistant, Zbigniew Brzezinski, had his arm reaching out to inform the president via a red phone at three in the morning that an attack was on the way. The president would be told, we launch our weapons or we use them. He would almost surely not be told, and Mr. President, it doesn't make any difference, which you do. That's the reality. But as far as we know, no president has ever been fully briefed on the notion of nuclear winter. Uh, Gorbachev uh, does give indication that he was well informed on that subject. And Reagan, by the way, referred to it. He was not one for being brief very much in detail on anything, any more than Trump. But he seems to have been aware of it. As far as we know, the latest results from the last decade have not been briefed. Uh, people like Alan Roebuck and Brian Toon have tried to, uh, have asked to brief the high levels on this, have never been taken up on it and uh, are not really aware that it doesn't make any difference what he does. On the contrary, the weapons have been sold both by the Boeing and Lockheed and by the Air Force and the Navy on the grounds that they can destroy Russian ICBMs, which seems like a worthwhile thing to do in a war. Whatever happens, isn't it better to have eliminated their ICBMs? Seems plausible. And the answer is no, it won't make any difference. It simply won't make any difference. You say, well, why not then get rid of our ICBMs? What are they good for? Well, they're not good for saving lives in the U.S. in any circumstances, whatever. They're not good for any political purpose. But they're very good to make for profits, jobs, and to reassure our allies that we're working hard on this problem and we remain their protector in what amounts to a protection racket. Uh, we have built up the, the threat from the Russians ever since uh, about 1947. And since then, in the interests of presenting ourselves as their only protector against an overwhelming threat, and very much like the mafia's protection rackets in Chicago or elsewhere, 
give us this money, you know, let us control your business, or you'll regret it. And there the threat is in principle, I mean in practice, uh, or we'll blow you up ourselves, but the implication is, or our rivals will, will hurt you and we'll protect you from that if you give us your tribute. That's basically our relation with NATO ever since. So there are interests in maintaining and building this doomsday machine. They are domestic, political, and their alliance interests in doing it. What there are not are any ability to influence our uh, events in our benefit or save lives in any circumstances, whatever, if they were actually launched. So I repeat what I said earlier. No president has actually wanted to launch those weapons, but they have all wanted to be able to threaten them or... In some cases, I think in their own minds, they were reluctant about that. They wanted to keep their jobs, which depended upon their not being charged with weakness or appeasement or with withdrawing from this competition and and have the donations of Boeing and Grumman and the others go to their rivals. So we act as if they believe that it was worth being able to make those threats. And in fact, probably in various circumstances, the threats have had some effect that can be regarded as useful, have had a deterrent effect. I can be specific in a moment about that. But at best, that has been at the cost of maintaining the possibility of destroying most life on Earth. What do you think has most changed about the situation since you were working on nuclear security issues for RAND and the Pentagon in the 50s and 60s? Well, I and my colleagues were all suffering from a delusion given to us by Air Force intelligence, which in turn was very biased in their estimates by a desire to face a very strong enemy, which it took the Air Force to hold off and increase the Air Force budget, the forces, the promotions, the bases, everything else. So Air Force intelligence was telling us that they were moving toward, the Russians were moving toward hundreds and ultimately thousands of ICBMs against which we had no real defense, and never have had, and never will have. There never will be an anti-ballistic missile system that actually protects us from a large-scale attack by Russian ICBMs, accompanied by decoys and other evasive measures. So given that circumstance, they said only deterrence can do it. And they also posited, and I believe this at, uh, how old was I, 27, and my colleagues believed it, that we faced an enemy that was essentially hitler with nuclear weapons, a Nazi-like regime in Russia armed now with nuclear weapons. And that was plausible to a degree because uh, Stalin was, in fact, as ruthless as Hitler, uh, probably killed more communists than Hitler did in Stalin's purges and in famines in the Ukraine and elsewhere. And so he's totally ruthless, brutal, murderous, and also was in occupation of East Europe. The thought the realistic thought that that occupation, which was very costly to the Russians, was primarily defensive against a resurgent Germany, was never in our discussion. I don't remember ever hearing such a thought, that it was anything but a precursor to their taking over all of Europe, as Hitler had tried to do. They're in East Europe, they want West Europe beyond Germany, and uh, only we can keep them from having it. So it seemed very dire circumstances. In retrospect, I think that was always a delusion, that, that Stalin always was aware that that would be effectively a suicidal, in the nuclear era, a suicidal uh, attempt by him, and, and had no practical inclination to do it, and was concerned about a German resurgence, in fact, as he said. But we tended to dismiss that as just propaganda very foolishly. Here you have a situation where Russia has been devastated twice in a century by Germany. And the idea that they were sincere in saying that they worried about that happening again in Germany, not right away, but in Stalin, and then later Khrushchev used to say 15 years or 20 years long ago, uh, simply we didn't take into account at all. So their buildup, their, their weapons seemed to us purely offensive and aggressive, and moreover, they were ahead of us in ICBM technology. They fired their, uh, launched their first ICBM in 1957 uh, in, I forget when exactly, I think it was like August or September. We weren't able to do it. We couldn't get one off the ground until months later. And, uh, of course, they put up Sputnik, which showed that they had the accuracy to hit our cities at least. So uh, in those circumstances, there was a third factor. Very strangely in retrospect, somehow, 
But uh, my colleagues, like my very res- admired, respected mentor, Albert Wolfsitter at RAND, my mentor, took the attitude that the Russians could not be deterred from attacking and gaining world domination by any damage less than they had suffered in World War II, which was at least 20 million dead. Now it's usually put something like 27 million. And the idea was they saw themselves, Wolf sort of said, as having gotten through that very well. They're here they were, 10 years later, doing very well in the world. So they knew they could stand that. The world domination would be worth that, he thought. So we had to we had to uh, assure that under any circumstances we could kill more than 27 million people. And again, that went along with this Nazi this implication that they were Nazi-like, genocide-prone country. Again, in retrospect, that was totally unrealistic in terms of Russian attitudes. When I first went to Russia in the mid 80s, just before Glasnost, or just and just in the early stages of Glasnost. I became aware that the, the Russians I met simply vibrated with horror at what they had gone through, being, as they said, fought over twice in, uh, in World War II, first with the Germans moving east across their country, and then in a fighting withdrawal, moving west again, and both times, in effect, devastating them. And the idea that they were prepared to uh, do that again couldn't have been further from the truth. After all, in our country, we never had anything comparable to that except the Civil War, which, which was limited geographically very, you know, to a limited band of the country, unlike theirs, and was far beyond our, past our memory in the North. <laughs> the South, to this day, clearly uh, retains the idea that they lost a noble cause uh, to preserve their way of life, namely slavery, uh, something for blacks very comparable to the totalitarian regimes. So I had this idea then that it was very hard to achieve deterrence and that you had to think in terms of massacre as a possibility because nothing else would deter them. As I said, that, that had no particular relation to reality, but that's what we believed and or what I believed. At the highest levels of the Air Force, it's now clear, they did understand from our reconnaissance programs, various ones before the U-2 high-flying plane and then Uh, later planes like the SR-71, but in particular satellites, had revealed to the highest levels of command that the Russians had almost no ICBMs at all. But that was not passed on to us at RAND. And actually, the commander of SAC, Strategic Air Command, when I visited them in Omaha in August of 1961, was estimating that the Russians had 1,000 ICBMs. We had 40, but they had four. We learned that a month later. So we had 40 to their four. Plus we had uh, many intermediate-range missiles within range of them, both Polaris and land-based, and several thousand planes in um, range of Russia, whereas they had something like 192, which were not at all planned for attacks on the U.S. They didn't have the air refueling capability. We imagined they did, as we did. So they had essentially nothing against the U.S., Even so, we knew that they could destroy Europe, their neighbors, with intermediate-range missiles or short-range and planes and bombers, which we couldn't destroy in a first strike because they were mobile, there were too many of them, too many bases, and uh, we couldn't find them. So had we attacked the U.S. in 60 or 61, say over the Berlin crisis, the U.S. might not have suffered a single casualty which might be the case if we attack North Korea now, for example. Would that mean we'd win the war? Well, from one point of view, yes, we'd have devastated them, suffered perhaps no casualties. Or if they had some submarines at sea that we didn't find, we might have lost a city or several cities even, uh, which would be more casualties than we'd suffered since the Civil War. But uh, compared to them, that would be victory, unless you counted what they did to our allies, who would have been annihilated. So our threats of NATO always uh, involved the total devastation of our allies, of NATO, and uh, absolutely uh, inescapably. It's not clear to me to this day how conscious the NATO allies were of this, you know, or why they allowed it. Well, again, you could say it's the difference between actually having it happen and threatening it. Uh, they could hope 
that our threats would keep it from happening, and that, in effect, it did work, or at least there was no war. It might have been necessary. I would say not, but uh, it could have been. But were they really thinking of the possibility that it would not succeed, it would be the threat, and that they would be totally annihilated? Now, there are those anti-nuclear people, of whom on one, but who believe that there's no effect you can point to at all that where deterrence worked. I don't agree to that. I would say that West Berlin remained capitalist and remained allied to the West. Inside East Europe, 250 miles, I think it was, uh, within East Germany, surrounded by Soviet divisions, I would say that that remained uh, on our side only because of the threat of blowing the world up. There was no other way of keeping Russians from simply walking in and taking it over, and they wanted it. They didn't want that example of capitalist freedom against their East German uh, oppression. They didn't want that as a route for people escaping from East Germany. They would have liked to have it all that time, but they couldn't. Not because they were certain we would blow the world up at great cost, but because we might. And that was not foolish. We might. That was our plan. We had no other real plan. And we might not have carried it out. The president might have decided to let Berlin go, or he might not. And that was enough to keep the Russians out. So there you have an effect of some benefit to the West Berliners, for example, but uh, at the cost of preparing to blow the world up and the possibility that that would happen. So for the benefit of the audience, I'd be interested in going through some of the some of the lessons that I took away from the book, uh, which I think are, are likely to be particularly interesting to them. And maybe you can comment. One of them is that secrets uh, seem to really be kept. So there might be a lot that we don't know that uh, it was possible to keep information confidential, uh, at least about yes, nuclear stuff yeah. uh, most of the time. Yes, uh, very much so. The very fact that our NATO commitment involved a continuous first use threat, a threat of initiating nuclear war was not in the awareness of most Americans from beginning to end of the Cold War. They really, a majority, actually, of Americans said in polls that they did not think it was that protecting West Europe from an invasion would justify initiating nuclear war. But they were not aware that that was the very basis of our our commitment and always has been and still is to this day. Now, uh, West Germany, or Germany now, is not in any tangible danger from Russia at this point of invasion. Uh, One could say, however, that Poland and the Baltic states can't say that as definitively as uh, West West Europe. And yet we remain committed in the case, let's say, of uh, even a covert invasion of Lithuania to initiate nuclear war if necessary. It might not be necessary. In fact, it shouldn't be. Our non-nuclear capability against Russia, any kind of Russian aggression, is enormous. We spend 12, with U.S. included, 12 times the defense budget of Russia. And without the U.S., West, uh, Europe alone in NATO spends four times as much as Russia altogether. So the idea that Russia could take even its neighboring countries against the determined European defense is not sound. Uh, yes, they could uh, muster a larger ground force element against the Baltics, let's say, and then NATO could. But in terms of air power, our ability to isolate that battlefield with air power and to destroy them to any desired degree with non-nuclear forces is, is very overwhelming. Nevertheless, Poland and the Baltics prefer to have that additional threat of uh, blowing the world up if it happens. It's understandable that you might say that they want that. You could also say at this point, it isn't understandable. You know, is it really necessary or worth, is it really moral to rely on a threat of exterminating the Northern Hemisphere or all of it? Well, we have for the last half a century. So it's not less moral than their, than their other members of NATO, but it's not necessary. And I think we should not be threatening under any circumstances, whatever, to initiate nuclear war under any circumstances, whatever the desires of our any allies might be for that threat or for that assurance. Uh, our alliances should not and need not, from any real point of view, be based on such a threat and a preparation. But that's where we are. So we'll come to this later, no doubt. But if you were to ask what I think should be changed in the world, it would one of the very things at the top of that list would be to forego the in- threat of insanity of initiating nuclear war. Yeah, we'll get to uh, the next section is on uh, yeah, what policies we think should change um, and what, what can be done to make this better. But another uh, lesson that I took away from the book is uh, the extraordinary extent to which the military misleads, I think, uh, their civilian control and indeed like other parts of the military. For example, they 
would withhold information from the president, for example, the number of weapons they had uh, in, in the late 40s, how likely they were to be used, uh, like how they were being delegated. They also, um, LeMay and I think others, schemed to be able to use nuclear weapons even without Kennedy's approval because they worried that Kennedy uh, wouldn't be willing to, to use them. Uh, so they're not necessarily, at least at that time, were not as well controlled uh, by uh, civilians as, as yeah. perhaps was thought. And also it seemed like they would mislead other, other parts of the service, like the Air Force would mislead the Army and the Navy in order to increase its funding. There's a lot of territorialism and they would often just promote uh, projects that didn't really have much of a defense function simply in order to boost their budgets and payroll. That's true of all the services, by the way, I would say. In this area, it was the Air Force that had the main responsibility for nuclear war, so uh, very interested in making it seem realistic uh, that a nuclear war might occur and hiding the fact that it wasn't. To this day, so far as anyone knows, the Defense Department and the services have not conducted realistic studies of what would happen in terms of nuclear winter, in terms of the smoke that would kill harvests from their attacks. It's not something they want to know. And if they did, uh, their instinct to keep that result secret would be extremely uh, great. And their ability to keep it secret has been shown to be very great. For example, the um, Pentagon Papers, which I revealed in 1971, uh, show that over a matter of 30 years, really, the services altogether in the Defense Department in the White House did manage to conceal from the public the threats they were making in Vietnam or their own estimates of what the effects would be of uh, carrying out their threats and how unlikely it was that those threats would bring victory or would end the war. And uh, when it came to a determination to escalate the war in 64 and 65, they kept very secret for many years their plans to do that, just as 30 years later or so, the uh, George W. Bush uh, administration kept entirely secret from the public their plans to invade Iraq for over a year. And right now, the public knows very little about the degree of our involvement, for example, in Yemen, our air support in terms of refueling and loading and, uh, and target information to the Saudis in carrying out massacres in Yemen. Major war crimes that are happening every day are not in the consciousness of the American people at all. The fact that this power had been delegated and remains delegated to several extent in certain circumstances, if communications are eliminated, for example, uh, on our nuclear weapons, that's not in American awareness. It's been kept very secret. And in terms of lying to the president, people in the system uh, who have been in it and have studied it ever since, like Bruce Blair, who was a Minuteman launch control officer, have shown that the belief by the Air Force in particular that its weapons must be launched in the event of warning, launch on warning, uh, rather than be destroyed, is so strong that if a president ordered otherwise at a time when the Air Force was convinced that there was an attack on the way, it's very questionable whether the president would be obeyed. They certainly don't bring that to his attention or her attention if we ever have a female. What is a fact is that the president has no physical capability to prevent those weapons from being launched. He or she does not possess a code which is necessary to the launching of those weapons. The so-called codes that are in the president's football, the briefcase, the computer uh, that accompanies him at all time are simply to authenticate, to identify that person as an ability to give the order. But if his or her desire was to stop or not to respond, that intention would not limit the uh, people who control the weapons from launching the weapons. There are locks on them which prevent the lowest levels of operation from launching the weapons on their own initiative without a code of some kind. But how high does that combination uh, you know, reside? Uh, certainly not in Washington, where it could be destroyed by a single bomb. It's more widely distributed than that, very possibly very widely distributed. And uh, uh, so it's quite likely, really, that if a president decided, I don't care, they are about to attack us, but I'm not going to join them in this and simply bring nuclear winter that much sooner, very unlikely that he could get a big. Or at least, it's let's just say it's not certain. It's enough to say that. And uh, the fact that that is the case is something that is not brought to the attention of the president. 
Uh, another overarching lesson that I took away was just uh, how people in collective groups are just capable of insane brutality and uh, like extraordinary, like making extraordinary decisions, maybe doing terrible things without even necessarily making a decision. So, for example, when the hydrogen bombs were invented, uh, it was just kind of assumed that all of the bombs would be upgraded to to be hydrogen bombs, which would increase, you know, the effective yeah. uh, like uh, deaths by ten or hundred fold. Uh, well, ultimately, I guess by a thousandfold if, if you uh, once we knew about nuclear winter. Yeah. And there was never kind of a conscious decision that it's necessary from a military point of view to kill a hundred times as many people as um, was the previous plan. Uh, but that just that just kind of happened because the technology became available. Similarly, just progressively over time, uh, during World War II and after, uh, we became uh, inured to the idea of destroying cities. That this was actually the idea of um, just bombing cities and killing lots of civilians was uh, previously forbidden. And uh, you know, even even the Nazis uh, uh, kind of typically refused to to bomb cities uh, en masse, and they apologized when, when they did it. When you say the once. Nazis, uh, Hitler uh, didn't want to start a two-sided exchange against cities, and he ordered that uh, it had to be on his authority only, and so forth. But that doesn't, you know, it gets away. In fact, very early in the war, there were a number of cases where uh, bombing occurred uh, that was neither known to the higher command or intended by them. Uh, for example, uh, the bombing of Britain actually started when, uh, the British cities, I mean to say, when uh, some German bombers bombed London, the suburbs of London, by accident, thinking they were against it uh, over a different area not realizing they were hitting London, Hitler having forbidden them to bomb London unless, unless they'd evoke uh, you know, retaliation. So the British took that as a deliberate bombing of London and immediately reciprocated with uh, some long-distance raids against Berlin. And Hitler said uh, day after day, if you keep doing this, you know, you're going to get it back, basically. Churchill did keep doing it, uh, in part because as a commander, he preferred that they use their force against London than against factories or against airfields uh, elsewhere. And it did evoke then, uh, eventually it ended in the Blitz against London at a time when uh, the British, when attacks on the airfields might have been far more effective than it was that. But anyway, there's a number of examples like that. And um, uh, these accidental attacks of various kinds have escalated in the past and could do so again in the future. Yeah. Another example uh, that, that where Hitler comes in is that um, when we detonated the first uh, the first bomb uh, yeah. during during the testing in uh, 1944 or 45 or 45, 45. I think. Yeah, uh, they weren't actually certain that this wouldn't uh, ignite the atmosphere uh, that's, and, that's and lead right. to the it's, destruction that's of all life. I go into it. it some length in the book because I, I find it so emblematic of the situation we're in today. The fact is that the scientists who exploded that bomb, the first so-called Trinity test in July of 1945, knew they were gambling. They thought it was unlikely but possible that that would ignite the atmosphere and the uh, the nitrogen in the atmosphere and the hydrogen in the water and destroy all life on Earth, all life, even microscopic, in a fraction of a second. And uh, indeed, the most um, distinguished experimental physicist of them all, Enrico Fermi, uh, while knowing that their calculations indicated that that was extremely unlikely, also knew that those calculations weren't that reliable. It, it assumed that their model was correct, that they hadn't missed yeah, anything that, out. Yeah, that assumed that the model was correct. But, uh, but he understood that as an experimental physicist that there was a good possibility that they had overlooked some major interaction, uh, some effect of some kind, and he thought the probability of that was 10%. Now, that's not small at all. And yet, he went ahead with it. Uh, in fact, the very first bomb that I described earlier, there was a, a, a test explosion in 1952 of a hydrogen device, but it was not a droppable bomb. It involved liquid tritium and a very huge apparatus, many tons, stories high. Uh, it wasn't a real bomb. But the first droppable bomb with dry lithium deuteride in 1954 was three times the yield that they had calculated as its largest possibility. Now, the zone of danger from which shipping was to be excluded uh, near the atoll uh, was based on this worst case, they thought, estimate of, I think, uh, something like five megatons, five million tons of TNT equivalent. In fact, it was 15 million tons. And that resulted in fallout not only on many islanders in the Marshall Islands, 
but on the crew of the uh, Lucky Dragon 5, Fukumaru fishing boat of Japan, which came back into Tokyo with uh, one sailor dead from radiation, the others all uh, injured by it, and a boatload of tuna that had been irradiated, which went into the market. And uh, when they realized that, had to you know, cut off the sails of all the available tuna at that point. And that, in a way, evoked the modern anti-nuclear movement and the anti-testing movement altogether. This was in 1954. But how did that happen? Well, the initial reaction of American officials was, well, it must have been inside the danger zone that had been forbidden. But it wasn't. It was 100 miles away. And uh, how did that happen? Well, there was, in fact, uh, an interaction that they had not foreseen. The, the fuel for the hydrogen reaction, the fusion reaction, lithium deuteride, involved a compound of lithium-6 and lithium-7. And one of those, I think, was, I don't forget, but the lithium-7 was believed not to contribute to the explosive yield. It was just there because it was too hard to separate. And uh, in fact, under the conditions of the fission explosion of the trigger, it did interact, it did provide neutrons, and it tripled the yield of the explosion. Now, that was exactly the kind of effect that Fermi had feared just nine years earlier when the Trinity test went off, that something they had not, that they had thought was impossible, might not be impossible, and might occur. And yet, he went ahead, he didn't say, there's a 10% chance here of blowing, he did offer odds, actually, uh, of the chance that the state of New Mexico would be incinerated, and different odds, uh, presumably somewhat lower, that all life on Earth would be burned. And we don't have a record of who, if anybody took him up on that, or exactly what the odds were that he offered. But uh, we do have this quote that he said that day, that he thought there was a 10% chance. Did Truman know that there was a 10% chance? As close to certain as we can be, not. There's no evidence that anyone at the high levels in Washington was told that there was a real chance, however small. And that was not small, of course, 10%. But even if it was three in a million or two in a million, as some thought, nevertheless, a chance. Remember, at a point in the war when victory was assured, the Germans had already surrendered. And the Japanese were known at the high level to be negotiating for surrender, terms of surrender, and were certain to be defeated at that point by blockade or otherwise, with or without an invasion. So the reason for taking even a one in a million chance of this happening was not justifiable, I would have to say. Certainly was problematic, to say the least. The idea of taking a 10% chance is hair-raising. And granted, as far as we know, no one else thought that the chance was that high. But this was the best experimental physicist in the world, Enrico Fermi, who thought that. And uh, uh, at the other extreme, Hans Bethe, who got a Nobel Prize for this kind of process later, thought there was no chance. There was no chance. But he was alone in thinking that. You know, no, almost nobody else believed that you know, with his confidence. So um, the, this is the chance that was taken. Well, what I'm saying is our leaders and our scientists have been taking gambles like that ever since without telling us. And it was 30 years before, uh, well, let's see, uh, 40 years, 1945 to 1983, basically almost 40 years, before people realized that the smoke, which had been ignored as a factor in this calculation, would have this effect. It's sort of like ignoring lithium-6, you know, or something for the whole period. But that was 35 years ago. And we've lived ever since with the knowledge that, to say the least, there is a possibility that our war plans would destroy life on Earth. But does that keep people from preparing it or threatening it? No, it doesn't. Uh, yeah, I just mentioned uh, Hitler there, because apparently uh, this concern about igniting the atmosphere was one reason that uh, Hitler didn't want to pursue an atomic bomb, uh, That's right. which well, curiously didn't, didn't stop us there. <laughs> yeah. he, uh, when uh, Speer told him about it, Speer says Hitler was not delighted with the idea that he might be the cause of destroying life on Earth. He didn't like that idea. And he went on to say, someday, he said, the scientists will, in their egotism and their pride and everything else, be uh, setting the possibility of the earth, setting the earth on fire. He said, someday, it won't be in my lifetime, he said. Well, it wasn't exactly in his lifetime. He died uh, when in the first week in May, 1945. But two months later, they were making that experiment. 
Yeah. Another example of just the crazy things that people can do in groups is uh, the Joint Chiefs of Staff during the Cuban Missile Crisis apparently uh, were just extremely keen uh, to, to go to war in Cuba, even knowing that there was yep. a decent chance that this could escalate to, to all-out nuclear war. And similarly, Castro, from what I've read, yeah. was yeah. absolutely willing to yeah. go to an all-out nuclear war. And he was asked in some later interview, Did you, like, what do you think would have happened uh, in, in, in that case? And he said, well, Cuba would absolutely, like, everyone would have died in Cuba. Yes, but Cuba socialism would, would prevail. Yeah, that, he was so ideological. And I guess to some extent, I mean, so were the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, that they yeah. were willing to like, see their societies totally destroyed for this. No, the, the Joint Chiefs, I think, were not afraid, is for reasons I've told earlier, that the U.S. would be destroyed. They weren't worried about that and if worse came to worse. They knew that Europe would be destroyed. But as Lindsey Graham has said, Senator Lindsey Graham, about a war with North Korea, he said there would be terrible casualties, but they would all be over there. They don't get a they vote. They would not be Americans. Now, that is not reliable because all it takes to kill Americans for Kim Jong-un is a boat with a nuclear device in it. We know he has material for up to 60 such devices. We don't know how many he's made into warheads. But he doesn't need a warhead that can get through the atmosphere without being destroyed uh, after a missile ride. All he needs is a device, like the Trinity, ones that we know he's tested, on a boat. He doesn't need an ICBM. He needs to send a boat over with such a device. doesn't even have to have a crew. It can be artificial intelligence, a simple drone into a harbor like San Francisco or Los Angeles, or for that matter, a container that could be sent anywhere in the country. Uh, the container with a device in it could be triggered by a drone, a remote device. So he could be wrong. You know, nobody's perfect. Sorry about that. You know, it wasn't all over there. But what he's saying is, he's uh, falsely assuring us that it would all be over there. And that would be acceptable to protect us from the risk or the threat of being destroyed ourselves, our cities, by an ICBM. It would be worth sacrificing South Korea or Japan, large parts of Japan. Well, that sounds insane, and it is, but of a very ordinary kind of insanity. It's basically what we have contemplated with Europe for the whole entire lifetime of NATO. So, yeah, in the book you discuss uh, nucle nuclear winter a lot, and you're uh, very confident that if hundreds of thermonuclear devices were detonated, that uh, would be very on likely— On cities, yeah. On cities, yeah, would be very likely to, to suffer a nuclear winter. I've spoken to some smart people who are somewhat skeptical about that, or at least think that it's an open question, uh, how, uh, how likely a nuclear winter is and wh whether basically the, the particulates would get high enough in the atmosphere to stay up there for a long time and block out the sun. Um, do you have any view on kind of the current state well, of the Well, first, of the I don't have a personal view in that I'm not a scientist. Yeah. I was an economist. <laughs> <laughs> Same. <laughs> not really a scientist. Yeah. And uh, so I have to pick who I rely on here. The... Um, you just made me aware that there is one peer-reviewed study that raises questions about the likelihood that a small war between India and Pakistan using only fission devices would have the effect that Alan Roebuck and Brian Toon and others have reported in peer-reviewed articles, by the way, would result from a war between India and Pakistan involving only 100 fission devices, 50 on each side. Now, they're not limited to 15 kilotons, which they had assumed. They have boosted devices now, which would be at least 50 kilotons, which would make a difference. But uh, they still don't have thermonuclear devices that we know of, even though Kim Jong-un has claimed that he's tested an H-bomb. It takes more than one provisional test, in any case, to have a reliable H-bomb. Now, if uh, the calculations that Toon and Roebuck made in 2007 of such a result were that it would not cause nuclear winter or a global diminution of sunlight by 70%, but a diminution by about 7%, which would not kill everybody on Earth uh, by starvation, but would shorten harvests and kill enough harvests as to starve the least nourished 2 billion people on this planet between 1 and 2 billion people, or about a third of the Earth's population, not all of it. And this new article by Los Alamos questions that the effect would be that great or that prolonged. And it remains to be seen how challenging this result is since it's based on a classified computer model, which they've so far been unwilling to share, so that the chance of replicating that by people who aren't paid by the government to design nuclear weapons and sell them 
is negligible at this point. You can't replicate it. You can't check it. But he wants to do that. And of course, of course, that's the way science proceeds. Whether that would have much effect on the... There are other questions about whether that's uh, on the, the basis of their calculations. Were they looking at the right kinds of targets altogether that were applicable to an India-Pakistan war and so forth? So that remains to be seen. There has been no other peer-reviewed article actually questioning their results. This is the first. It comes from Los Alamos, the design laboratory. It still doesn't address the question of the larger war between U.S. and Russia with thermonuclear weapons causing nuclear winter. I am told, by the way, by somebody I do trust very much, a scientist who works for the government, that there is very little uncertainty about what would happen if as much smoke as Roebuck and Toon and Turco and the others um, imagine does get into the stratosphere. That will cause nuclear winter. But that there is still some uncertainty as to just how much will get up there. That's the question raised by this new study, by the way. And uh, that you know needs more research, no question. Uh, I mean, you can't have too much in a way. The fact is the Defense Department, which alone has the classified data on the actual targets, the actual yield, the height of yield, all the things that affect the amount of firestorm, all of that is classified. And there are outfits like the National Academy of Sciences that have done classified studies on such matters and could have access to all that. I would say I have no higher aim than to encourage Congress to appropriate the money for such studies. Very small amount of money, by the way. And no one has done that. They don't want to know on that what the effect will be because it cannot improve the sales of ICBMs or drones or new testing or whatever. Uh, it's, it's something they don't want to know. They have no need to know, and they don't want to know it. The rest of us in the world, every country in the world has a stake in that information because they are all threatened by this occurrence. But they can't do the studies themselves without knowing the plans and the targets. They can only do you know analogous studies or hypothetical studies of the kind that have been done already with very ominous results. So that's something that I would like to see happen Uh, It won't happen under a Republican Congress, it seems clear. And it's never happened under a Democratic Congress. But but Democratic Congress coming out of 2018, uh, this year, elections, seems to be necessary, though far from sufficient, in learning what we need to learn about this. And then it would take pressure on that Democratic Congress. Really, they'd have to be more concerned Democrats than we've ever seen before to confront these very powerful corporations. They get donations from them, the people on armed services committees and others, and they would have to confront. They're not in any rush to do that any more than they're in a rush to confront Exxon on climate or Brown and Williamson on tobacco. That's the way the system works. Yeah, at some point, I really need to speak to one of these researchers to help me get to the bottom of uh, this question on the yeah of, of, of this winter. paper. Maybe, you... maybe Robok uh, potentially mm-hmm. I could talk to to yeah get get up to date on what's the what's the state of the of the research there. There's one good thing about Trump. I think it's that it uh, it has made people more worried about uh, nuclear yes. security. Yes. And, and I guess you could imagine that Democrats in Congress might be interested in studying this. Uh, his his policies up till now, with the exception of the fact that he's very critical of NATO, that's mm-hmm. new. But his nuclear policies are really very much in line with uh, the ones we've had all along. There's no big turning point there. And the idea of spending $1.7 trillion in modernizing the doomsday machine, we got under Obama, not because he wanted it, but because it was the only way he could get Senator Kyle, K-Y-L, and others to uh, vote for New Start negotiations, was to promise this big buildup. I would question whether that was a good deal to make at all. Uh, and of course, he could have gone back on it, or Hillary could have. But she has no shown no indication that she wanted to deny the, the military-industrial complex anything it wanted. Uh, as a woman, she's under question about her strength and her militarism, and she's shown every indication uh, her her political career was based for years now on being known as the person who would support the military in any of their requests mm-hmm. for intervention or for force buildup. So, if anything, uh, Trump was a better prospect for changing this, but he hasn't shown any indication of doing it. It would have to be done with Russia to a large extent. Uh, His friendship with Putin, whatever the basis of it is, would be promising in that respect, that together they could go down. He even spoke about that a few times during the campaign and even since. 
But Putin hasn't shown any indication of a desire to go down. And he has the same incentives that an American president does. He has his corporations that are supporting him, his oligarchical friends. And uh, to call Russia an oligarchy is well-founded, and not more so than the U.S., I would say. Just before we move on from the book, uh, what do you think are the other best sources that uh, people who want to pursue a career in nuclear security uh, should read? I guess Eric Schlosser's uh, Command and Control often comes up as a good as a good read. Um, is is yeah, there anything else is. that you would recommend? Well, uh, by the way, uh, Schlosser's book is so good that when I read it, I thought, gee, well, now I don't have to write mine. You know, it's all <laughs> out there. And then when I reread it this morning, I said, no, I have a number, a few points to make that he doesn't. He did get some things that almost nobody else had. The delegation issue, for example, is in there. Uh, I alone was the person talking about that for decades. And uh, he has a number of, uh, he's much more on the accident problem and the false alarm problem than I have. In my book, I just referred to his to a large extent and to Bruce Blair and Scott Sagan and a few others. So that's an excellent book to read. Helen Caldicott, a former head of the Physicians for Social Responsibility here, uh, the American part of the group that got the Nobel Prize in the 90s on nuclear war, the International Physicians for Prevention of Nuclear War. Helen Caldicott edited in Australia uh, a book called Sleepwalking to Armageddon, which is very, very good last year on the where we are exactly right now, more up-to-date than mine is. Uh, in fact, it came out just after mine had been printed, and, uh, or I would have referred to it more. So those are two good ones. But And I would put my book as one definitely worth reading uh, in that trio. So on, on the question of, you know, there, there are, of course, many others. For, uh, going back in history, Fred Kaplan's The Wizards of Armageddon is very good. On the Cuban Missile Crisis, I think it's called one Minute to Midnight or something, by a very good one on the Cuban Missile Crisis. So let's move on and talk about yeah, what specific policies you think yeah. would be useful and perhaps like practical and feasible for the U.S. government or, and other yeah. governments to potentially implement. Uh, so I guess if you were elected president tomorrow, uh, oh. Oh. Uh, what would be your ideal uh, approach for the U.S.? Remember, if, I'd, if we were to imagine my being elected or anyone like me at a younger age, we'd have to assume a change in our political economy, you know, a significant uh, case. It wouldn't be other things being equal. Uh, other things being equal, I wouldn't be president. Yeah. But um, and a lot would have had to change, and from my point of view, for the better. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> it would be a big change. But if we look at things that are imaginable politically without massive changes in our political economy, changes in the distribution of income and the power of corporations and so forth, but are still imaginable. Let me take things that really do involve enormous risks, let's say to most of the corporations in this country and the rich people, other than those who profit immediately from the arms race. Uh, in other words, it's almost hard to explain how things that profit only Boeing and Lockheed and Grumman who are powerful, but you know, hardly the majority of our corporate wealth and profits. How do they manage to get away with policies that, that threaten everybody? Well, and, and, and even just that re require a huge tax bill that other rich people would oppose, right? In general, you'd think that other corporations or yeah. other rich people, they don't want to pay the taxes that fund all of this enormous right. infrastructure at the cost of a trillion dollars. Well, that affects, you know, is it unimaginable that, that really billionaires should decide that for their for the benefit of society, you know, that there should be more progressive taxation. And the answer is that Warren Buffett, among others, has said right along, uh, he should be taxed more and the others should be taxed more. So it's not unimaginable. It's just that they have not succeeded in, uh, in winning on this, but it doesn't seem unimaginable that they would. What then would I go for things that, that do seem to, to involve disproportionate danger and risk, disproportionate to the, any benefits to uh, the society as a whole, and in particular to the most powerful people in society. All right, let me just start at the top of the list. Uh, I said earlier, launch on warning is an absolutely unconscionable uh, basis for our defense policies. There's no way you can make it called necessary. We should eliminate the ICBMs. And there has been actually major proposals for that by influential people in the Defense Department for many decades. They just always lose in the end, uh, without it ever having become a matter of public discussion until we learn later. Uh, even I stay very much in touch with this sort of thing. 
have been frequently surprised to discover how seriously such good proposals were taken some decades earlier. We learn much later. Specifically, the president, uh, President Barack Obama, favored getting rid of the ICBMs. And also a very closely related question of uh, rejecting first use of nuclear weapons under any circumstances. People get this wrong so often. Let me spell this out a little bit. First use, the phrase first use for, for any initiation of nuclear weapons, including tactical weapons, short-range, relatively low-yield weapons, as in short-range artillery or uh, missiles in a limited war of some kind, but any kind of first use. First strike refers to initiating uh, or launching long-range strategic weapons, essentially against the homeland of our major opponent, the Russians, or vice versa, uh, before enemy or any warheads have arrived on our soil. It might be after they have been launched, but before they've arrived. Or escalating from a limited conflict to an attack against the homeland of the other superpower. And so there's two basic ways that a first strike could occur. One is what I just said, an escalation of a limited non-nuclear or nuclear, limited nuclear war. For example, a war between the U.S. and North Korea that uh, we decided uh, had to be escalated to an attack on China as well or against Russia. We have first strike. Having perhaps already taken first use of limited tactical weapons by the U.S. or by North Korea, but uh, escalating that to a homeland strike against Russia or perhaps China would be a first strike. The other way would be in anticipation of an imminent or ongoing strike by the opponent. Preemptive, getting it off, as some said, striking second first, getting our weapons off the ground before they're attacked by the other side, imminently about to be attacked. Now, when I say launch on warning, that refers to this latter preemption, uh, where there has been some indication, either strategic, uh, perhaps a covert agent, or, or a set of events, a uh, limited war that we think will probably escalate, or by warning from our radar or our electronic warning on satellites or infrared warning that enemy warheads are on the way, such as has happened a number of times. And launching our weapons before that warning has been confirmed by actual explosions. And remember, even one or two explosions might not really confirm that a large attack was underway. It might have been a terrorist or a third party of some kind, or a rogue or a, you know, an unauthorized action. So until you've really had a rather large number of weapons, a dozen, half a dozen, 20, hundreds, whatever, that indicate a concerted, you know, full-scale attack, any launch before that is a launch on warning. That should never occur. In, in the past, it was in, even till now. It's been imagined, because it's a good way to sell vehicles, that launching them first gives us a chance of limiting damage to ourselves. But since by launching we cannot attack their submarines, if anything we attack their submarines by anti-attack submarines that are in the water already that go after them, that's not a real launch on warning. It's our planes, which can be recalled, or our missiles getting off a launch pad before they're attacked that is launch on warning. That should be eliminated, and it should have been eliminated 50 years ago or, or more. Along with that, the weapons that must be launched before they are attacked, our ICBMs, should be eliminated. They do nothing for us other than make us look big and crazy. And that's not without its effect. Uh, looking big and crazy makes the other people cautious up till the point that it, it makes them decide they have to strike first. But uh, it can have a beneficial effect. But at a, not in a way that can't be achieved otherwise or that is necessary. And it is a way that involves a continuous risk of blowing up the world, which is shorthand for actually it doesn't, nothing we do will blow up the world, literally, or even kill all life. After all, most biomass in the Earth is microscopic, and much or most of that will survive, even a nuclear winter or nuclear war. But larger animals will all go. So, uh, except us, and will mostly go nearly all. So, that is not justifiable. So, get rid of the launch on warning. Get rid of the weapons that are for launch on warning, ICBMs. And now, a third step I would take, which is unilaterally, 
we would improve the world's security and our own if we did either of those things or, and or also, uh, divested ourselves of that large part of our submarine force which threatens their land-based missiles. If I can spend just a moment on the asymmetry here. The Russians rely on their ICBMs in a way we don't because they don't rely on their submarines as we do. Their submarines have more of a tendency to bump into each other and or to fall to the bottom of the ocean. They've had a number of serious accidents. But more important than that, they're subject to an American anti-submarine warfare, which will not get all of their submarines, but which will give a number of them. They're not willing to rely entirely on their submarines, and so they do rely on their ICBMs. It's hard for me to imagine they're getting rid of all of their ICBMs in that circumstance, just as it's hard for me to imagine North Korea, Kim Jong-un, getting rid of all of his nuclear weapons. I don't expect that to happen. He depends on that for his deterrence and his survival, and Russia feels they depend on having some ICBMs. We don't require those ICBMs. We don't benefit from them in any way, other than the one I described, which is not, by the way, just imaginary, conjectural. To look crazy enough to buy these useless things does make us look crazy enough to to launch them, (laughs) and that can be deterrent. Uh, but at this, as I say, at the risk of destruction of everything. So we should get rid of those. No first use policy on our part, even unilaterally. All the better for Russia. All of these things are even better, much better, if Russia imitates them, uh, which is not guaranteed. But they are good for us even if they don't imitate them. And certainly our ability to press them in various ways and shame them or uh, educate them or whatever to get rid of their first use policy and their launch on warning depends necessarily on our getting rid of it, although it's not guaranteed by it. So those would be three major things I would do. I would uh, thus reduce the number of our warheads first by the ICBMs, but also sub-launched missiles, warheads. Not to zero, however. Yeah, um, so a lot of that, should we want a ban on all nuclear weapons or do, should we just be looking to, to reduce the number? Now we get to an important issue. 122 nations have signed now, although I forget how many, but maybe 20 or more have actually ratified, a treaty to ban nuclear weapons and, and to make illegal any possession of any nuclear weapons. The Pope, speaking not legally but morally, has said now, in contrast to his predecessors, that any possession of nuclear weapons is morally condemnable. Now, similar to the ban idea. Unfortunately and predictably, all of those 122 nations are nations that do not possess nuclear weapons, and they are not allied to nations that protect them with the threat of nuclear weapons. So not one member of NATO uh, has signed such a treaty, nor has any member of the nine nuclear weapon states. Actually, one member of NATO did take part in the negotiations, only one. Do you Netherlands, know I think. That was? Yeah, yeah, the Netherlands. But they were, and they, they took part because they were ordered to do so by their parliament. Or they wouldn't have done it on their executive branch. But they were ordered by the executive branch to vote against it. So I don't foresee that approach by itself expanding very much, in part because, like the Pope, It is legally or morally condemning the possession of any nuclear weapons, and most of the the people in the nuclear weapon states and their allies don't agree with that as a moral norm or as a prudent action. Nor do I, actually, at this point, given that other countries, including opponents, have nuclear weapons. It's hard for me to say, uh, I, I can't see, that it is morally condemnatory, for example, for China to have any nuclear weapons, since it's had serious adversarial relations with both the U.S. and Russia, Soviet Union in the past. And India, for that matter. And India, you could say. Likewise for India. Or uh, that it's morally condemnatory to have some nuclear weapons rather than leaving a major adversary with a monopoly. It's not only that most people will not agree, I will be among those who will not agree that it's morally obligatory for us to unilaterally divest ourselves of all nuclear weapons while Russia retains some, leaving them with a monopoly. It's not only it's not that I would expect Russia to attack with those weapons necessarily or very quickly, 
But it is very plausible that it would encourage them to take aggressive actions of various kinds, bold actions, reckless actions that they wouldn't take otherwise that might very well lead to conflict, and if not to immediate nuclear war by one side or the other, to a buildup. So it seems to me that whereas I do think that a world without nuclear weapons would be a very much safer place, and that is a desirable aim and should even be a practical aim, if not in our lifetime, in our children's or our grandchildren's lifetime, but by the same token, in the nuclear era in which we live, I would say that war, major war, uh, should be abolished, in effect, should, should not be an instrument of policy, should not be tolerated or legitimated and prepared for, but that, rec- that implies a considerable change in our, in our world order, in our system of resolving conflicts. And rather than say, well, in other words, that's like changing the gravitational constant, or uh, you know some currently unthinkable thing that should be thinkable. We should be aiming at that, and they go together. I find it hard to believe that there will be sufficient trust in verification and enforcement for countries who now rely on nuclear weapons entirely to rid themselves of them, so long as they do face a real risk of attack or of invasion or occupation. You mentioned uh, Castro earlier. Castro is the one major leader, you know, a very small island, who has been faced with imminent invasion by a nuclear power. Let me take that back. Uh, Saddam was faced with that, of course, and did experience it. Uh, So was Afghanistan by Russia. Uh, So what's the difference? They did not, those countries did not have recourse to nuclear weapons themselves. But Castro had nuclear weapons on his territory which, by the way, did not have locks on them, and which his people could have taken control of, rather than say to Khrushchev, which would certainly look rational, do not use those nuclear weapons or we will be annihilated. He could have said that, and uh, and he could have backed it up with uh, non-nuclear force, taken over the weapons himself. But he wouldn't have had to with Khrushchev, and Khrushchev would have agreed to that almost certainly. Yeah, Khrushchev seems quite sane. Uh, yeah, from the, yeah. the historical. Now, was it insane then for what, what Castro did do, as the youngest leader around uh, at that point? What he did do was say, "I assume you'll use them. That's fine. And therefore, if it's going to be a nuclear war, which it is, because we're going to use them, you should go first. And he said that under the mistaken impression that Russia had a couple of hundred ICBMs, when in fact it had about ten, some say forty. But uh, socialism would not have prevailed. The northern uh, Eurasia would have been annihilated. And actually, some American cities would have gone, starting with Oahu, because Khrushchev had ordered a nuclear uh, sub with nuclear missiles offshore Hawaii in case a war erupted. Now, to what effect, what good would it have done in the world for Hawaii to be annihilated while Russia was being annihilated? Nothing, no good. But that was his plan, secretly. He, he ordered that secretly, and not for deterrence. He didn't tell us that that would happen. He just did it. Nor did he tell us that he had nuclear warheads ashore. Now, this is, to me, inexplicable rationally, or I, I can't imagine what that was, except as a simple bureaucratic trend in Russia to keep secrets even when you would be safer if you exposed that secret. The secret being that he had nuclear warheads in Cuba. When I look at that warhead, I believe, and I've never seen anyone else say this or raise it, and I didn't get into it in my book for space reasons, the what if or the, you know, the hypotheticals that might have occurred. I wanted to, but my son said, Dad, this is not a book about Cuba. You, you, know, you don't have space for this. But I would have liked to say... Khrushchev could have won that crisis at any point up until Saturday, uh, October 26th or 27th, when he, when he gave in, by simply revealing he had nuclear weapons there, which he did. In fact, if he didn't, he could have still said he did, but he did have them. And he could have shown them to our surveillance, not all of them, just one or two. Open them up for inspection, send your U-2 over, send a low level over, take a real good photograph, send a ground observer over and let him look at this thing. See, we have nuclear weapons ashore, which was true, which would mean to Kennedy an invasion was out of the question. Now, when the Joint Chiefs contemplated the possibility that there were nuclear weapons ashore right at the end, their proposal was, let's put nuclear weapons with our troops. That was refused. That was insane. 
<laughs> what the hell were nuclear weapons of their troops going to do if our invasion fleet was about to be destroyed by their nuclear weapons? You know, having them on the ship wasn't going to do anything for you. The ship was going to be vaporized, you know, if they had them. Uh, it does make the Joint Chiefs insa look insane, and in important ways they were, but as I say, in a way that is institutionally endorsed, normal insanity, organizational insanity. I don't have even that, as I say, for Khrushchev, except that they just were generally very secretive and didn't notice that this was an occasion they should not be secretive. To Castro, for him to say, given that we're about to be occupied, better that we all be annihilated and they go down with us, see, and that capitalism go down. Now, he was the only one really tested like that, where he had an opportunity not to see nuclear war occur or to let it occur. And he let it occur rather than be occupied. Well, that could be seen as saying, well, being occupied, let's say, by the Nazis, uh, or in this case, by the Americans, we don't want to be occupied. Something very odd that I've never seen commented on was his armed forces were entirely organized for guerrilla warfare. They had come to power by guerrilla warfare only a few years earlier. They were now enormously greater than that. They had militia. They had the whole country organized, much more than uh, Vietnam did, for example for guerrilla warfare. So why was being annihilated preferable to... Uh, being occupied probably temporarily. Yeah. You know? Uh, they weren't quite as well situated for it as Vietnam in a number of ways. They were an island. They could be surrounded. But on the other hand, they had a 600-mile mountain chain, the Sierra Maestra. We would have had a hell of a time occupying Cuba, as would have been recognized a few years later after Vietnam. But this was 62. So it wasn't as clear to us what a threat guerrilla warfare was to us. But Castro should have known that. That's how he won. And amazingly enough, he, rather than be occupied, he made the choice that they should use the nuclear weapons at the cost of their annihilation. Well, this is, I think, uh, you can't single him out as a single psychotic leader. I think that was a test of what humans in power do, how, how crazy they can be when it comes to uh, questions of war and peace and life and death. You know, the, there's no way to real, make real sense out of almost any of the decision-making that led to World War I. You know, you can give their reasons. Uh, they had reasons in every case, each country, uh, for actions that led to the destruction of their empire. But they weren't good reasons. Uh, they were, it was terrible. And uh, what I reveal in the Pentagon Papers was not just poor decision-making. It was crazy decision-making. But it was normal for humans. I forget how we got on this entirely, but... The... Well, I was just thinking about, yeah, what, what is the most practical and useful thing that the U.S. Uh, could do to make the world safer? Nuclear yeah, to make it safer. So I have a number, number like... of things. Move against, there should be no armed conflict between the U.S. and Russia. That should be inconceivable now, as it is not. We're preparing for it. We're deploying for it. We're getting ready. It's preparing to blow up the world in the sense in which I've described it, for annihilating most large animals on the earth. And that is scarcely necessary. It would be hard to imagine it was necessary even if you were confronting Hitler. That is reckless and ruthless, not only ruthless, but recklessly expansionist. And we haven't seen that. We haven't seen a Hitler in uh, a great power, including atop the U.S. I think the reason... There has not been not been a war in the 70 years since 1945, a result which was, in fact, hard to imagine for people in 1945, was that the phenomenon they were, that was a reality then, Hitler, not with nuclear weapons, but up until that point, might have nuclear weapons, but in 45, the expansionism of Hitler was easy to project onto the Russians or the Russians onto us. They expected a first strike. Actually, no president was Hitler and no leader of Russia was Hitler, not in terms of ruthlessness, but in terms of wild gambling expansionism. We haven't seen that. If we had, we would not be here. In other words, if what people reasonably worried about in 1945 had occurred, had, let's say, a uh, Idi Amin, or what, what should we say? Saddam, I think, was very aggressive. But had he been on top of the U.S. or Russia, uh, we wouldn't be here. The, the world would have blown up. So it's important that there, that not occur and that there be other ways of uh, confronting reckless leaders somehow other than 
threatening to blow the world up. For example, we should not be reproducing a Cold War, which we are at this point, where you don't negotiate with Russia. When Trump speaks of negotiating with Russia, some support that, his followers, and many do not in the Democrats. The latter are, in my opinion, not just wrong, but crazy in this traditional widespread craziness. To say that we should not be collaborating with Russia, not cooperating because of Crimea, let's say, and to analogizing Crimea to Hitler's invasion of Poland, that's a totally mistaken, misleading analogy for a lot of reasons, and a very dangerous one. And I'm saying the idea that that shows that we can no, long, no more negotiate and cooperate with Putin than we could with Hitler in 1939 could not be more dangerous. So in the short run, I would want to change that. Here's an amazing irony. If you look at Trump, Donald Trump's policy views, I would regard them as not just mistaken, but as despicable in nearly every instance, except one, yeah. which is that he wants to cooperate with Russia uh, and not get into war with Russia over Syria or Ukraine or anywhere else. In my opinion, whatever his motives, and I doubt that they're very creditable, I think they probably have to do with being under subject to blackmail by Putin, which makes him reasonable on this point. But whatever his motives, he's right. We can take the on opportunity. That, point. that is the point I think that most motivates the opposition to him from the Democrats. What they regard as his most vulnerable point is the one point I would say where his policy is right and realistic, and that is is not preparing for war with Russia, because you're preparing for world omnicide, basically, when you do that, and not uh, moving in a, in a different direction. So why in the world are they attacking him on that point? Well, partly because they think he's politically vulnerable and the Democrats can get back in power that way, uh, and they might be right about that. But by pressing that point, they are making omnicide more likely. And uh, why, by the way, are they going for the Cold War? That happened before Trump. That was under uh, well, both Bush Obama. And Obama, yeah. Obama. And uh, it was definitely backed by Hillary in terms of the arms buildup. Why? Because only Russia provides a target system that can rationalize advanced weapons to get through their defenses. Their, we need long-range standoff weapons so our planes can get through an air defense system which only one country in the world has, like Russia. Others have similar weapons, but not in the same network. Our planes have problem getting into only one country in the world, Russia. Uh, so for that, we need long-range standoff weapons for Boeing and Lockheed or whoever makes them. You can't rationalize new Trident submarines against ISIS or against Assad. You just can't. Only Russia uh, allows that uh, incentive and likewise ICBMs, and so forth. So in other words, to keep these assembly lines going and to keep rotten Connecticut working on uh, attack submarines, for example, you have to have somebody with submarines to attack, and uh, that's Russia. So in order for these, you might say, military Keynesian motives and for profit motives, basically, we are reproducing the doomsday machine and encouraging the same kinds of factions in Russia to reproduce their doomsday machine. And this is a, a human a tendency of people in power to maintain their power and their wealth and everything else, which I don't know how to change. Uh, I have to hope, and I do hope, that we find a way to do it, but I don't yet know what that is. Yeah. So your preferred policy is that we get rid of land-based ICBMs completely. And most of our get, SLBMs. Yeah. Okay, so... The so we'll are down a little less a, dangerous because they can be recalled. Yeah. Okay, so we ha would end up with, what, 100? The, like, SLB, something, the reason something I want like to get rid UK of the... Has. I'll get to that right away. Yeah, yeah. The reason I want to get rid of the SLBMs, which nobody else talks about, is I prefer the Russians not to think that their ICBMs are in danger of being... Uh, being uh, destroyed entirely, which our SLBMs can do. And we've just put on super fuses on our SLBMs to make them capable of destroying hardened ICBMs. And that does nothing for us at all, except, but it does give the Russians an incentive to interpret alarms from their radar of the kind that occurred in 1983. They got a false warning from their satellite system. Their ICBMs were in danger. Was that possible? 
Yes, we had enough weapons to do that. We should make it clear that we do not threaten long shot warning and we do not threaten counterforce against Russia because it's hopeless. It's infeasible. It is as infeasible as a highly effective anti-ballistic missile system. Now that, the scientists are all lined up on saying, that's impossible. It's infeasible. The truth is that our counterforce efforts against Russia are just as infeasible. They have too many, they have submarines, and you can't get them. You, unlike the ABM, which may be fooled by decoys and, and maybe not hit any warheads, the anti-ballistic missile, our ICBMs can find and destroy their ICBMs. Not all of them, probably, but a lot of them. Not the mobile ones altogether, but they really can hit it. They could make, by the way, hundreds of decoys over there. That was discussed in connection with our MX system. We could build lots of holes, and they wouldn't know which hole it's in. But it's expensive, and we didn't do that, and they haven't done it either. So you say, okay, we really can destroy the ICBMs. Isn't that worth doing? And the answer, no, is not being made by any politicians because what does it pay them to do that? No one gives them a campaign contribution for saying that Boeing is just wasting money. No, no, you don't say that about Boeing because Boeing would then come back and say your bridge to nowhere is not needed or your infrastructure project here is not needed. So congressmen don't oppose each other's district profits. So what do you think of China's current stance? It sounds like you would like I, us no, to get close to where China is. China has pursued a relatively sane, even totally sane, nuclear policy all along. Uh, they have, at first we thought they only built a dozen or so ICBMs because they couldn't afford more. That was plausible. But only for the first 10 years or so after 64. Since the last 30 or 40 years, it's obvious they could build many more. They could have as many as we do, but they don't. They don't feel a need for parity, which they don't have, which they don't need correctly. Their policy has been no first use and open, explicit encouragement of a ban. It's now questioned for reasons I don't know entirely. Well, I could say our anti-ballistic missiles might have some effect in reducing damage from a first strike against the small Chinese force. Not against Russia, but against China. So they have reason to think we might not be as deterred as we used to be against China. We seem to be preparing for a war against China. So they are now considering, although so far haven't adopted, launch on warning for the first time. That'll make the whole world less safe if they do that, and I hope they don't. But they're also considering building more survivable weapons. It means more weapons, more submarine weapons, more survival, more mobile weapons, uh, with some basis that we don't look as deterrable as we should because we're still threatening and we're still preparing. So unfortunately, they are building up. I presume that's the reason they did not sign on to the ban. Otherwise, I don't know why they wouldn't. It's totally compatible with their policy. Their policy, it, well, it's not compatible with, uh, I take it back a little. They have a minimum deterrent. So it's not compatible with a full ban, immediate ban. I think they've said that in principle, they would like a world without nuclear In principle, nuclear they weapons. want a world yeah. without nuclear weapons. Yeah. Well, um, in principle, I guess, but so, in so would we. Well, okay. More of a now, of course, thing. a number of our presidents have said that. Obama got a Nobel Prize for it. Trump doesn't say it, uh, but uh, Reagan said it. And Carter said it. But they each had a huge military buildup. So they said it. Now, China has said it and has not had a huge military buildup. So they're a lot more plausible on that. No first use. We favor elimination and a minimum deterrent. No pretense of damage limiting counterforce first strike capability. They do not pretend to believe in that or to be trying to get it, unlike the U.S. and Russia. So what I would like to see is China to press as a world leader on this. And I've asked wh whether that seems possible or not. Unfortunately, people, China experts tell me that China has such a strong tradition in the last century of saying, we don't intervene in another country, we don't tell them what to do, we don't intervene, non-intervention, sovereignty, that it is against their whole Philosophy. inclinations and visions to be telling other countries, do as we do. I wish they did actually, on that point. And uh, I don't know enough to say it's impossible. But people who do know China more say that's extremely unlikely, unfortunately. But I don't hesitate to say, as an American, we should look at China 
and we should pursue a policy like China's. And that means endorse and even negotiate toward elimination of nuclear weapons in the longer run, verification, policy, you know, everything else. But in the meantime, while other countries have nuclear weapons, we should maintain a small capability to respond, a survivable capability to respond in a limited way, which is not, by the way, to say we should necessarily use that capability. In fact, I can only think of one circumstance I won't go into. It's just too complicated. Where it might make sense to launch a nuclear weapon or more. Uh, but in general, except for a very small possibility, there's almost no circumstance in which it would make sense, for, in my terms, to respond to a nuclear attack with a nuclear weapon by the U.S. Any circumstance in which it would be necessary, desirable, optimal, anything, but second use is as crazy as first use for the U.S. Is that because, uh, of course, it can't protect you because the missiles are already coming? And I guess, too, it just makes you worse off what because, good is it because do? you just get a worse nuclear If you winter. send them over there, uh, what targets could be hit that would be of any benefit? Whereas if you send them in targets near cities or in cities, you're just adding to the smoke. Uh, in the end, the result will be the same a year later. But it will come a little faster. Mass starvation will come a little faster if we burn cities in addition to our cities that are being burned. But nevertheless, a capability to do that should be taken very seriously uh, by any adversary because the likelihood that we will use that capability in revenge, yeah. even if it doesn't do any good for us, is very high because yeah. we're human. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Okay, so uh, that's your kind of um, medium, uh, like so a, a moderate disarmament policy. So how many weapons does they get down to? Yeah. I would say, by the way, a handful of propositions here. In my opinion, these are normative statements. No country has the justification or good reason to have a doomsday machine, first of all, which Russia and the U.S. do. And the other countries are on the verge of it. Uh, all the countries except North Korea could cause starvation up to a third of the Earth's population. That's eight countries can do that. None of them should have that capability. What is that capability? Well, it's something between 100 and 200 weapons. And uh, eight of the countries, uh, let's put it this way, seven of the countries have at least 100. Israel probably has more, but is only estimated to have 80 or some. I think it probably has more than that because of the Nunu's uh, revelations many years ago. North Korea doesn't at this point. So it follows from that. No nuclear weapon state is justified in having as many weapons as it now has. Not one of them can justify. India can't justify having 100 nuclear weapons. No. To what effect? Or, or now we have Israel with its 80 and so forth. But you can't have, you can't justify more than 100, let's say. That isn't to say you can justify 100, but you can't justify more than that. All right. Uh, fourth, no country can justify having as many weapons as the smallest nuclear state other than North Korea. And you can't have as many weapons as Israel, certainly not as many as Pakistan or India, or, uh, you know, little, or England and France, or you know, in that zone. As a first step toward ultimate elimination, but also toward uh, a relatively stable situation, I would say for the U.S. and Russia to come down to the level of the other nuclear states, you know, something between 80 and 120, not striving for superiority, which is meaningless except in conveying craziness, which has a diplomatic benefit under some circumstances, but one that comes at too high a cost, too high a risk. So it means coming down to 100. Now, what should they be? Not I, They should not be vulnerable weapons, if possible. I am very unhappy that the Russians depend on ICBMs to the extent that they do. But at least if they could get down to 100 warheads, they would not be pretending to a, to a disarming capability. They would not be encouraging the other to go, us, to go launch on warning. Uh, likewise, if we got down to 100 sub-launched weapons, and really, how large? Actually, we can't really justify having thermonuclear weapons, 100 kiloton weapons. The, the Trident II has uh, two capabilities for warhead. Uh, one is 475 kilotons. We don't have a reason for that or a need for that under any circumstances, including deterrence. 
what I'm saying is to deter a country rational enough to be deterred at all does not require an ability to annihilate them or to destroy the world. Uh, but if you were to say a capability of hitting 10 to 20 of their cities, that's very deterrent. And to not have that in the face of their capability does not make the world safer, necessarily. It might, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't rely on it. I wouldn't try to convince people that it was the case. In other words, to be a little, little bit more technical about it, uh, we're talking about having very low-yield sub-launch weapons because Russia has some. Actually, uh, you can burn cities with the fission weapons that Truman had in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. They cause firestorms. That's the trigger of our weapons. So you could disarm all of the thermonuclear, the secondaries, what are called the secondaries, the lithium, deuteride, H-bomb, fusion fuel, and so forth. Just use disarm it. it. Take it out or make it incapable. You don't need boosted weapons. You don't need 50 kiloton weapons, which they all go for. That involves injections of tritium into the, into the core. Do without that. As Herbert York put it, what does it take, who was the first director of Livermore Laboratory, and then director of research and engineering, and then uh, in the Defense Department, and then a major arms control negotiator? He asked at Livermore the question, how many weapons does it take to deter an enemy that is capable of being deterred? from a nuclear attack. And he said, one or 10, or at the if you really stretch, 100. He got to that by saying, 100 weapons gives you the capability of one individual to destroy as many as people as died in World War II, 60 million in a day or two. Shouldn't have more than that. So he said, the number you need for this purpose then is between one to 10 to 100 and closer to one than a hundred. That gets you down, by the way, to the area of North Korea, pretty much. Now, North Korea is not, does not have adequate deterrence right now, unfortunately. They're facing a lot of threats, but that's because they're going for a bigger capability. They would be pretty safe, I think, if they gave up their ICBM and uh, H-bomb tests yeah. right now. The threat against Korea and Japan, which does not require that, should be enough to keep even Trump, even you know Trump, Trump's excuse for, for hitting them anyway is that they're trying to get a capability against the U.S. Let me make one point here, a historic point that is, has been made, to my knowledge, only by Noam Chomsky in the past. And he bases it on McGeorge Bundy's comment in his book about nuclear war as follows. Bundy said, having addressed this question in 1952, when the first test was approaching uh, said, it's notable in reflection, that there was no discussion of avoiding H-bombs altogether on the grounds that they would make ICBMs feasible. Now, it was the H-bomb that did make the ICBM look feasible to us immediately. And the reason for that was that the, it was known that the early ICBMs would have a very large error, probably very inaccurate. Half of them would not land within perhaps 7 to 10 miles of a city, which means even uh, an A-bomb would not have much effect, even on a city landing seven or ten miles away. But an H-bomb would. And so a small H-bomb you could put on a missile could uh, destroy a city, at least, even if it was this, the missile was very inaccurate, which they knew the early missiles would be. As soon as they developed a feasible H-bomb or had the teller Ula device in early 51, 1951, uh, a guy at Rand, actually, uh, what was his name? Bruno Augenstein, immediately said, this makes him uh, an ICBM effective. Mm -hmm. Now, why should that have been avoided? Because only ICBMs threatened American society. When I was born in 1931, and until much later, no American city was susceptible of being destroyed by an enemy. Ever. Really. It hadn't happened since 1812 when the British invaded from Canada and burned the White House. Uh, in Civil War, we burned Atlanta and so forth, but that was our own people at short range, on the ground. American cities, I lived in Detroit, the arsenal of democracy. We had air raid drills, but they were just for show, like duck and cover in the 50s. There was no danger of Detroit being destroyed. With long-range bombers, you could destroy a city with an A-bomb, but, to get, but not more than a couple. You know, we could have air defenses. You could keep A-bombs from getting through to us in large numbers. 
ICBMs you couldn't. So ICBM would make American society, in large numbers, would make an American society vulnerable to destruction, as it has been ever since the mid-60s, which is when there was, the Russians had a lot of ICBMs. So why not aim then at no ICBM? Why didn't we aim at having no ICBMs uh, and, and uh, along with that, no H-bomb warhead that would give you the ICBM, okay? The answer seems to have been that we were worried about all our bombers getting through their defenses, and so we wanted an ICBM that would get through their defenses. We already had thousands of planes that would get through, but we'd lose a lot of them. So what? You know, you know what possible purpose could it serve uh, to have several thousand warheads there instead of a handful or a couple dozen, if we're talking about deterrence? But our plans were based on getting through their defenses. For that, we wanted an ICBM. For that, we allowed the Russians to get an ICBM. You could have prevented that very easily by a test ban. Our radars were absolutely capable of verifying whether missile tests were taking place and how large they were. They were also capable of verifying H-bomb tests at that point because they're so large. So if you wanted to stop those, you just have a test ban. And there was some consideration of that, but it wasn't pressed, and it wasn't exposed to the public. Fermi, Enrico Fermi, that I was discussing earlier, and Isidore Rabi said in 1949, we should not be the first to test this stuff, and we should try to achieve a test ban. But no, no, we wanted it even at the cost of their getting it. And that meant we wanted an improved capability to destroy them, when we already had 10 times over the capability to destroy them, at the cost of our moving from being invulnerable to being vulnerable. And that was the choice that was made. And it was just a lot better for Boeing and Lockheed and Northrop Grumman and General Dynamics to go that way than not to have them. Then they wouldn't be selling the weapons. And by the way, what I've learned just recently by books like uh, a guy named Kofsky wrote a book called Truman, Harry Truman and the War Scare of 1947, reveals that at the end of the war, Ford and GM, who had made most of our bombers, went back to making cars very profitably. But Boeing and Lockheed didn't make products for the commercial market, only for commercial air, except there wasn't a big enough market to keep them from bankruptcy. They had suddenly lost their vast orders for military planes in uh, mid-1945. The only way they could avoid bankruptcy was to sell a lot of planes to the government, military planes. But against who? Not Germany. We were occupying Germany. Not Japan. We were occupying Japan. Who was our enemy that you needed a lot of planes against? Well, Russia had been our uh, ally during the war, but uh, Russia had enough targets to justify. So they had to be an enemy, and they had to be the enemy. And we went off from there. I would say that having read that book and a few others, I could say, I now see, since my book was written nine months ago, that the Cold War was a marketing campaign for selling warplanes to the government and to our allies. It was a marketing campaign uh, for annual subsidies to the aerospace industry and the electronics industry, and also the basis for a protection racket for Europe that kept us as a major European power. Strictly speaking, we're not a European power, uh, but uh, we are in effect because we provide their protection. Uh, against Russia, the super enemy, with nuclear weapons. And for that purpose, it's better for the Russians to have ICBMs and missiles and H-bombs. As an enemy, we can prepare against. It's the preparations that are profitable. All wars have been very profitable for the arms manufacturers. Nuclear war will not be. But preparation for it is very profitable. And therefore, we have to be prepared. I'm curious to know uh, what other policies uh, might help other than disarmament. So one suggestion I've heard is that we should uh, help the Russians get better detection equipment so they can detect yeah, no, attacks that's, earlier. No, wait, no, that, that's a terrible idea, oh, really okay. terrible idea. It's true that the world is less safe than it used to be because Russian air warning has gone down. They've lost the uh, satellites, their equipment is eroded and so forth. They're more prone to false alarm right. than they used to be. So are we less safe now than we were before? Yes, in that sense. And we would be more safe if we improved their system. We'd be back up to where we were before, which nearly blew the world up in 1983 and 1995 and others. They should not have a launch-on-warning system. 
nor should we. We probably can't get them to give up their ICBMs, but we can give up the threat to their ICBMs. Our SLBMs, our, our submarine launch missiles, are not under threat. China, by the way, doesn't threaten the counterforce of either Russia or the U.S. Do they have adequate deterrence? Yes. Would they have better deterrence if they had a 1,000 warheads instead of uh, 300? No. There is such a thing as having too many warheads, which we do and the Russians do. Because it makes the Chinese do not. They can't really justify 300 either, by the way. That's more than they can really justify. Probably most of those are tactical weapons against Russia. But what will that do for them? A tactical war against Russia will preserve Beijing? No, I don't think so. Or in a war with India, for that matter. So they have more than they need or should have, too, but a lot less than, than, than in our case. So China has been wiser on this point and is worth imitating right now. So uh, Russia has dead hand, this um, literal doomsday machine where uh, if it detects a nuclear explosion in Russia, or at least if it did during the Cold War, uh, it would send out rockets that would launch all Soviet uh, nuclear weapons uh, at various targets across the the northern hemisphere. Yeah, where they, that's they crazy would... for them. Yeah, they so, well, what, why, why uh, is well, that except crazy? in this respect, I don't criticize. They're assuring that decapitation is easy or possible. Even decapitation will not protect us, even against Kim Jong Un, but not against Russia. Of course, they will have arranged for their weapons to reply. But that doesn't mean we don't plan for it. Yeah. We plan for it. Yeah. It's crazy. It seems it has always seemed. I go back to when I was working on the war plans in 1961. That was over half a century ago. It seemed to me crazy to leave the Russians, which what we then believed were large numbers of ICBMs, which came to be true a few years later. It wasn't true then. To leave them decentralized without a Moscow to tell them to stop or surrender or end the war. Just let them fire away. You know, that, that looked to me crazy. But it's what we planned. It was something you could do. It might work. Yeah, I can't prove it wouldn't work. There's, what, what is it, one chance in a million that it might, you know, and so forth. Uh, and we've known that they had arrangements to launch anyway. So what's the one in a million? Well, the funny thing is that it seems like Russia's dead hand system, if we were more rational, we have could a, make we things have more... Oh, we have a same... Well, oh, it's effectively, it's effectively the same. Yeah. 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 But so if... Russia's uh, like literal doomsday machine seems like it would make the world more safe if we were more rational, because it would mean that we would never have any reason to attack them. At like we don't because it would be absolutely guaranteed. <laughs> and we don't, but we, I guess we so we don't anyway. But we but can pretend is, we do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we can pretend we do, and that is not without benefit. I have to keep saying it sells weapons, but there is another benefit by pretending that we believe we might decapitate them. We make ourselves look crazy enough to launch a war if they provoke us. It also makes us crazy enough to launch a war when we don't provoke us by a false warning. But we live with that. Uh, I'm curious to know, why is it that Russia kept dead hand secret? It's like a paradox that you create this machine that you want everyone to know about, but you never tell them. The same as us, our delegation of authority was our one of our closest held secrets and effectively held secrets for decades and to a large extent to this day. I put it out in my book and people are startled by it. But uh, actually it was in Schlosser's book and uh, there have been quite a few revelations in the National Security Archive going back to the 1990s. So that's uh, 20 years ago. So it's been available to some extent. Why was it ever secret? The whole point of delegation is to prevent your being paralyzed by a decapitating attack. But to not be paralyzed, to respond to the attack by attacking only hastens nuclear winter. It doesn't do anything for you. The only advantage to delegation is to deter decapitating attack. But you can only do that if you assure the Russians that we have delegated. If, on the other hand, we keep that a huge secret and deny it all the time and keep saying only the president can control this, the Russians, unfortunately, could conclude maybe they're telling the truth. Maybe only the president can do it and thus be led to a decapitating attack. So it was exactly the same in Russia as here. It's crazy for Khrushchev to keep that a secret, and it was crazy in exactly the same way for us to keep it a secret. Why in either case? Because what is being kept secret looks dangerous. Now, granted, if you want a deterrent effect, you pretty much have to delegate. But that does raise the question, 
is this the best way we should be assuring our safety altogether, as opposed to cooperation, coordination, collective security, what Gorbachev was calling for when he was in power, collective security. Let's don't increase our own security by reducing their security. The new way of thinking that Gorbachev, which is still called for, but that he proposed was, we're in this together and you don't increase your security by, in the traditional time-honored way, of decreasing their security in a nuclear age. Increase our security together by, for example, making nuclear winter impossible, which could be done uh, without eliminating nuclear weapons. You could still have deterrence, but if no country had more than, let's say, 10 or 20 weapons, like North Korea, you couldn't get nuclear winter. That would be good. Now, if they were all vulnerable weapons, uh, encouraging preemption, encouraging, that could make the world even less safe than it is now. But if you had submarine-based weapons, you know, for each nuclear weapon state, let's say, uh, a small number with no pretense of targeting or disarming your opponent, merely the capability to retaliate in kind, or if you retained that, you would have eliminated nuclear winter and probably nuclear war. There would be no advantage to it. And okay. then we couldn't pretend to be protecting Europe. And they would have to, uh, they would be more on their own yeah. uh, economically. Yeah. So are there, are there any other policies that you think would be good other than disarmament? Oh, yeah. And no, I'm saying it's not just disarmament. Much yeah. more important than that is to make very clear we do not threaten and we are not preparing an armed conflict with Russians. There shouldn't be any prospect of that. We should protect our allies by means other, certainly, than nuclear, uh, initiating nuclear war. We should protect allies by means other than threatening to blow up most life on Earth. And uh, the danger of non-nuclear conflict between us and Russia is such that let's say they did invade a Baltic country, which is not impossible. Uh, first, do we need a nuclear weapon against that? Even in military terms, no. Our air power against uh, their reinforcements in the Baltics, uh, we can't match them probably man for man uh, in uh, Latvia or somewhere. But in terms of ability to cut off their forces by air power, we have very great ability to do that. But second, in terms of their relations to the rest of the world, they're not Albania or uh, North Korea. The, well, North Korea is, is not at all cut off, let's say, from China. But uh, they're not autonomous. And uh, the effects, the political effects of that should be enough to dissuade them from doing that. If they did do it, uh, they should face economic, other military. What they would get is an enormous arms buildup for good or bad. I would say bad, but that's what they would get uh, if they did that. We should be aiming at what Trump talks about. For his, his bad reasons, are, I assume, are causing him to differ with the insanity of the cold warriors in the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, both. Therefore, preparedness. Yeah. Uh, you know, at great profit uh, on both parties. Even Bernie Sanders and uh, Elizabeth Warren, and as far as I know, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, don't think at all about uh, lowering the arms race. Uh, they haven't talked about it uh, because that's like gratuitously going against the tobacco industry or Exxon on climate. Why stack the odds against you that way you know, in our society? Well, the idea of showing the dangers of a Cold War, the necessity, the urgency of collaboration on climate. Right now, we have collaboration on dumping CO2 into the atmosphere. Putin wants to use his Arctic oil reserves. That's why he liked Tillerson, as the, who was you know, trying to make a huge deal for Exxon in burning oil and condemning us all you know, to, to uh, climate holocaust. That should change. There should be collaboration against climate change. Again, you know, China, by the way, has mixed obviously a mixed policy on this. Uh, on the one hand, they are leading the world, I believe, in renewable energy. And on the other hand, they're leading the world in coal-fired plants. Yes, there are ways, you know, like you're improving their air defense system. The world would be safer if we gave them several of our Trident submarines. But that isn't going to happen. <laughs> and, you know, they're, they're I don't more, think trust more dependable. And they could, if, if, if we could give them Trident submarines and they would get rid of their ICBMs, the world would be a lot safer. But that, A, isn't going to happen for a lot of reasons. And uh, B, there are better things to do than that. 
you, you talk mostly about uh, the risk of uh, war with Russia. Uh, I would think that in the 21st century, uh, there's kind of a greater risk of war with China over Taiwan or some other thing. Uh, do, well, do you have a view on that? Why? Uh, by the way, why should we get into war with China over Taiwan? Taiwan doesn't have the capability to, to mount a perfectly good non-nuclear defense against China. Uh, I would think they did. Why not? They're richer than China on the whole. Are they not man for man? There should not be a prospect of war with China. And uh, look, how impossible is this? Look at the European Union. Most of the countries in that were at war with each other, not just once, but twice in the last century. And now... It's unthinkable. It's pretty low. Well, you say unthinkable. Well, that's a little fast to <laughs> yeah. say. But, uh, probably, probably not West, France and Britain. Montenegro. Going <laughs> yeah. uh, Turkey and Greece, for sure, example. Yeah, yeah. Is that unthinkable? Western Europe, at least. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we, we did manage to get beyond that. And without having even as much world government as they should have, as we see from the Greek case and from the European currency case, they should have more of a federal government than they do. Uh, and the European the Parliament should have more greater powers than it does. But even so, they have enough to make that very unlikely. Since 1991, there has been no reason that Russia should not be in that same relation with the rest of Europe. I would say, I would say it was extremely unwise in the, on the part of the G.H.W. Bush, Clinton, George W. Bush, to move instead toward neglecting your, uh, Russia, humiliating it, not allowing it into things. Secretary of Defense William Perry, Deputy Under Carter, Secretary of Defense under Clinton, was strongly in favor of an alliance relation with Russia, Partners for Peace program, it was called, strongly against the expansion of NATO, which, by the way, I think the best first approximation reason for that expansion was selling arms to East Europe to, quote, bring them up to NATO standards at great profit to our arms makers. Why is Europe right now being, and this is not his finest hour, now we're outside the realm of Trump's sanity, uh, is calling on them to increase their NATO expenditure to 3% or even 4% of their GNP. Why? Without doing that, they are, without the U.S., four times the budget of Russia already. Why should they increase that? For one reason. He just gave it last week. We have very good arms for sale by, and he named the firms, Boeing, Lockheed, and uh, Raytheon. And, uh, Northrop Grumman, I think he said. And uh, what, what could be more blatant than that? They should buy our arms for our balance of payments and our jobs and our profits. That's why they should expand. They have no other reason. Uh, Germany isn't going to do it, as far as we know. Uh, there's no reason in the world for them to do it. He's calling on them an absolutely idiotic uh, proposal, uh, simply for our national benefit, profit. It sounds like a lot of your model of this is uh, based around this idea that the, there's corporate lobbying in favor of these policies to make money. How, right. how confident are you that that is the explanation? Because I imagine that no, some listeners might be skeptical. No, it's relatively new for me, frankly. Okay, yeah. And uh, there's been not nearly as much research on that as there should have been. I would like to know more about it. I just, uh, just sent to Amazon for a book. It's on the way called Buying for Armageddon that I've been told is good on this subject. Uh, I mentioned the one by Kofsky. There's a very good article, playboy.com, by a guy named, I think, Conroy, but the the title is memorable, Lockheed Stock and Two Smoking Barrels. And it's a play on the British uh, action movie, you know, Lock, Stock and Two Smoking Barrels. But it's an extremely detailed, well-researched article on the role of Lockheed in putting its own officers into the government to promote these sales. By the way, the current deputy... Uh, of John Bolton, as of the last month, is a former Boeing vice president for strategic systems. So the ICBMs are said to be in no great danger of reduction by Defense One, a, an online defense journal that I uh, that I see. If you spoke to the generals, uh, they would not yeah. say that they're doing. And then they it to, no, and you know. they they go out to highly paid jobs, uh, you know, in defense industry, and uh, to be commentators on MSNBC and the and Fox and others. When they go out, it's a very deeply ingrained situation, our military industrial complex. So I would say a major need is for investigation of the influence of lobbies uh, on this arms race as on climate, which were 
beginning to learn, you know, about about Exxon and the climate problem. And uh, there hasn't been nearly as much research. Granted, they are as secretive, if not more so, than the Defense Department without the benefit of an Espionage Act or an Official Secrets Act. They can't threaten prosecution for revealing their company secrets. They can only threaten civil suit for violation of non-disclosure agreements. But that is more than enough to keep their secrets very, very well. And so we don't know nearly as much about the inner decision-making by any of the firms I've mentioned, or DuPont, you know, or uh, the other arms manufacturers, that we do about the Pentagon. And we don't know nearly enough about that. So the field for investigation of that by journalists and academics is very important. Also, uh, in theory, (laughs) to some extent in practice, if you go to work for Congress, uh, you can work against the effects of these lobbyists rather than base your job on you know, conforming to them. There have has been effective legislative uh, reform of tobacco by investigations by various people and by whistleblowers, by the way, from inside the industry. Merrill Williams and Jeffrey Wigand, I mentioned earlier, uh, did just what I did, brought thousands of pages out for the help of Congress. And that has reduced the deaths from secondhand smoke in this country. It hasn't reduced their profits generally because they've increased their profits selling to third world people and to the rest of the world. So I think their profits, if anything, are up, which is despicable. I think actually the number of cigarettes sold is at an all-time high. And by the way, that was true before the Cold War ended by the socialist countries of communist China and Russia. I think uh, China's uh, had a monopoly of cigarette sales. I don't know where they are now. It's a government monopoly still. Maybe you happen to know, but I don't. Uh, what has happened to cigarette consumption in this country? Uh, it has gone down. In the now, US, I understand yeah. it's particularly gone down for young people. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. We, we, we could. Well, I'm not sure. We could look that up. Uh, I'd, I'd like to know that. And what has happened to profits for sales in this country? But I can believe they've gone down. But they have, you know, increased it abroad, abroad international, which is despicable. Yeah. It's the... As Lindsey Graham put it, the lives are over there. You know, selling cancer to people in the rest of the world is more acceptable than yeah. once we learn that it's over here. So opposing lobbies, investigating them, revealing, being a whistleblower, uh, going, making the secrecy system less sacred and legitimate and uh, impenetrable, uh, having a public interest defense for whistleblowers, I would, I'll would. i bet there could be legislative action that would restrict the effect of non-disclosure agreements when it's a question of criminal behavior or concealing results. That, of course, we find something new on that almost every day. Uh, something comes up from asbestos to uh, the airbags. And, well, every week there's yeah, some new revelation of people who have been behaving criminally. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Purdue, Purdue uh, Pharmaceutical. Mm-hmm. An article in Time last week pointing out that a deal was made where the Purdue pharmaceutical knew, admitted that they knew they were selling to uh, a non-prescription people. They know they were enormously contributing to the opioid epidemic, which is now the killer of young people. They knew that and not one criminal prosecution. And now there are several civil suits against people, but that's not enough. to. These civil suits are just cost of business. Yeah. There should be criminal prosecutions for this mass murder they are complicit in. In terms of what listeners can do concretely with their career to try to make a difference here. Well, I don't have uh, much of an answer there. It's skip to say uh, they can do otherwise and often better outside the government, the executive branch. 20, 30 years ago, I would have said that to know what the situation is and what might be done about it, one almost had to be on the inside, however problematic that is, and to have a clearance and have access to it. I could now say that's definitely not on, not the only way to do it. And I would say, on the whole, not the best. The chance of being compromised or co-opted in one's intellectual attitudes and values in a, on the inside is very great. It's not that people can't see and even recommend what would be very better policies from the inside. But the chance of having those implemented is negligible. It'll simply be overridden by the interests that go in the other direction. That's been the experience. Now, you could almost say the same from the outside, because that hasn't been very effective either. 
But there are some effects, though, that would not have been achieved from the inside. The test ban treaty and the comprehensive test ban treaty, which we still haven't ratified, would never have been signed or come about without uh, enormous pressure by scientists and others, uh, by a whole international movement in that case. Many, many people, millions, many millions on the outside. Likewise, we would have wasted perhaps a trillion dollars on ballistic missile defense uh, without tremendous outside pressure, a lot of scientific. The, the whole field of ecology uh, has grown up in the last few decades and led to several conferences on the violations of humanitarian law that would come about through any nuclear war. And, you know, more specifically, not just on law, but on human survival. And that has come almost entirely from the outside. Here we have one peer-reviewed article uh, coming out from Los Alamos recently on nuclear winter, questioning it, fine. But they could do this study, you know, with their left hand any time. They could have done it any month, at any time this year. This is the first one we've ever seen, and uh, and certainly not going to be the last. So, uh, I mean, a study on the subject. So it just doesn't get done from the inside. Now, it's true, you do learn a lot on the inside that you're, that you're not going to get otherwise. I've asked myself whether it could make sense for someone to go in to the cleared area, to the uh, community, get a clearance and do this stuff in order to learn and leak. And it's hard to say that that would be wrong, but it's a kind of deliberate spying, in effect, which I would find uncomfortable even when I rationally look at it and say, well, this is for the good of humanity. But it does involve lying from the very beginning uh, as to what your intentions are. And I don't, I can't advise someone to do that. I can't say that I would have ever been willing to do that, even though many lives would have been in state. On the other hand, I do, I would encourage anybody who goes in to get the clearance to, in their mind, when they sign non-disclosure agreements, which is what the security so-called oath is, it doesn't involve an oath in nearly any case. So help me God, I swear that I will not reveal and so forth. It's a non-disclosure agreement as in corporations or unions. I understand that I can be fired and even prosecuted for revealing this information. Now, I signed that many times without being aware that no one ever had been prosecuted before me. I was the first. So in a way, it was true. I could have been prosecuted. I was prosecuted, but I was the first. And the reason for that was that our First Amendment had always been understood to preclude a British-type Official Secrets Act, which would criminalize any revelation of classified information, whatever the circumstances. We still don't have an Official Secrets Act for that reason, although it's often been proposed in Congress or by the executive. But Congress has never passed it because of our First Amendment, which Britain doesn't have. But they have been using the Espionage Act as if it were an official secrets act. And that was intended against spying, that is, working for a foreign government, in particular an enemy during wartime, uh, to give them information that is properly protected from them. And uh, that was used often before me for against spies. I was the first to be tried under that for a non-espionage action for informing the American public. And it's written in a way that does not take into account your possible good motives or patriotic motives, or any kind of motives, for giving this information to the public. After all, if you're giving it to a foreign government, especially in terms of warfare, it's hard to cut any ice with a jury by telling him what your motives were. It's hard to make that look acceptable or patriotic. Now, if you're giving it to the American public, you should be able to argue why you think they needed to have it and what the effects were, whether there was any harm or whether there was any benefit. But currently, you can't do that. So something that should change is for Congress to pass what has been proposed, a public interest defense, which would allow you to argue your motives before a jury. But that doesn't exist now. So one would have to say now to make these revelations, uh, whatever you thought was in the public interest, would be a jeopardy of being convicted under the Espionage Act. Should you ever do that? Well, I would say, yes, there are circumstances under which I think I was right to do it and others have been right to do it. Snowden, I believe, was right to do it. Chelsea Manning was right to do it. And even though conviction was certain for them and under the existing law, 
with what intention should someone ever take that agreement not to reveal secrets? And I would say it should be with the private understanding of what should be explicit, so long as keeping the secret does not unjustly condemn others to death or does not conceal criminality or unconstitutional behavior. In other words, secrecy should not protect unconstitutional or criminal behavior, enormously reckless, dangerous behavior, but it does all the time. No, that's, that's the reality of it. But I think a person should be well aware that they should not feel bound by that, that the, uh, an agreement to keep secrets should apply absolutely only under the circumstances when that does not involve protection of, of criminal behavior. Watergate, for example. Uh, oh, but this applies all the time. Uh, I mean, things like that are going on all the time. Uh, should the people in the tobacco industry have felt bound by their disclosure agreements? Well, they were open to suit when they did violate it and tell the public, that uh, Congress, that in fact, contrary to the sworn statements of the tobacco executives in Congress, those executives knew that their product was carcinogenic and addictive and they were selling it to minors. But one person, um, two people I think of actually, one named Merrill Williams and the other Jeffrey Wigand, did in fact violate their non-disclosure agreements and reveal this fact and may have sailed just countless lives as a result. So it's not only the government that's involved here. Same thing uh, as the tobacco, the same thing applies right now to climate. Clear now that Exxon has been lying for decades about what they knew uh, as to the uh, effects of the carbon dioxide they were releasing. And um, what we've been saying in this whole talk is that the effects on human survival have been knowable, whether they investigated them or not, for decades now, been deliberately kept from investigation by the government. And uh, <laughs> it's so funny what we're discussing just today. Even a study which purports to contradict the dangers here is based on classified data that can't be examined by other scientists, including the scientists they're criticizing. Who, oh, as Alan Roebuck said to me today, that's not science. That's not what we call the science, scientific method. So, in other words, it is possible for people to save countless lives and preserve our Constitution or help to preserve it, attempt to preserve it, avoid wars. They have more power to do that than most of them ever imagined if they're willing to risk their careers and even their freedom and their associations and their way of life by telling the truth, that the power of truth-telling is very great, and not only by putting out the information, but by serving as an example to others that this is a patriotic and worthwhile, admirable even, thing to do at whatever risk. Not lightly, though, because the risk is great, personal risk. And uh, there's always the risk that you will be wrong, that you will have actually endangered people by doing this. Yes, that's a reality. But people who are in this position with this information generally are in as good a position to judge that reality as anyone else. Not always. And they could be wrong, and I could have been wrong. But it's very hard to find an example where people took that risk to their personal lives and had the effect of actually worsening dangers. Uh, in fact, no example comes to my mind right away, and I've studied this right away. That isn't to say it couldn't happen. But uh, despite charges that Ed Snowden or Chelsea Manning had blood on their hands by their revelations, the government in years and years now of opportunity has not given a single instance in which an individual was harmed by what they did, physically harmed, having claimed. Whereas, of course, the secret keeping has resulted in wars that have killed hundreds of thousands of people. So uh, that experience should be kept in mind. I know that many listeners are interested in pursuing careers in Congress or in yeah. the military or the intelligence services. So what would you say to them about your, your skepticism? What I said there was, uh, if Congress could get back and you could help it get back, if you could help it get back, the powers it had as a co-equal branch of government, which it has given up to a large extent, that would be for the good. The founders had it right, I think, and we've pretty much rejected that. But that model is there. That was their way of thinking that was new in the world, and it was a good idea. We get back to a role for Congress, to an investigative role, which they've largely given up, to work for Congress in that respect, very good. Uh, if you go in the executive branch, to be prepared to give it up if called for. 
uh, to be prepared to sacrifice yourself as a civilian as people routinely do in the military services. Uh, that would be a, a change for the better. And to spread that word, to improve the chances for whistleblowing, inform yourself as to what the history of those institutions is, mm -hmm. what the traditions of them really are. When Winston Churchill, as first Lord of the Admiralty, was uh, saying that something he proposed was against the traditions of the service, and he said, ha, traditions of the Navy, rum, sodomy, and lash. <laughs> yes, quite true, an empire. So I would say uh, spending a career as an anti-imperialist is better spent than working for the empire. But if you do go work for the empire, discover what the history is and become aware of what you're involved in that should not be happening. And then consider telling the truth about it, even at the cost of your own freedom and your life in the pursuit of saving many lives and preserving our constitution. We haven't even talked about movements here, uh, but you know that's another huge subject. I've spent the last 40 years of my life trying to build a movement against nuclear weapons use and use risk, like the one against the Vietnam War, and with some success in the 80s, but not since. So all that is can be done. I, I continue to participate in civil disobedience there to keep the idea alive for when again it might be powerful. Are there any individuals or projects or organizations outside of government working on nuclear safety that you're particularly enthusiastic uh, about? Well, on safety, I imagine there are, but I'm not sure what to identify. Uh, on the dangers of nuclear weapons, uh, very much so. Uh, uh, peace Action, uh, the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation, what you, Peace Action used to be the same nuclear freeze uh, campaign, but it still exists. The um, Natural Resources Defense Foundation used to be very good on this, but they've moved away from it. Most people have given up nuclear research. Uh, I give a whole list in, my, in the end of my book. You'd have to yeah. look at it. I, yeah. I tried to a number, 11 or 12 organizations that are on this. There is a fairly big movement for this ban movement, the ICANN, that is very good and rule for a lot of people in the world. I don't see that becoming powerful in the nuclear weapon states. It hasn't shown it. And in part because the idea of a ban is not even normatively compelling against maintaining some survivable minimal deterrent mm. in those countries. But that's not what any of the nuclear states actually have. So uh, without saying that it's illegal for them to have any nuclear weapons right now, it's much easier, I would say, to make a compelling case that they should not have the number and types that they do have right now, and that that should change even unilaterally as soon as possible. And that'll be hard to achieve, but I think less impossible than convincing people that we should unilaterally disarm ourselves of all nuclear weapons and leave Russia with a monopoly. Yeah, I agree with that. <laughs> How important kind of is, is game theory? Uh, very simply, uh, not at all. Uh, okay. I'm not aware of its having had any influence yeah. on anything. If okay. we're talking about classical game theory stemming out of the Neumann and Morgenstern and the work after that, including you know, very intelligent, very brilliant work by a lot of other mainly mathematicians, which, as far as I know, has not had any effect on any defense capability and never did have. The people I worked with at RAND uh, in the economics department, social sciences, even engineering, uh, had no background in game theory of any kind. I was the only one, in effect. And I was a, a critic of game theory in my earlier publications. Mm. Uh, my uh, honors thesis, actually, I wrote, perhaps, as far as I know, the first critical account of uh, zero-sum two-person game theory. So I was mainly a critic, but I knew the literature. And I was very influenced by Tom Schelling's kind of work, which was not in that tradition at all. It was bargaining theory, very ingenious, very innovative. He got a Nobel Prize in the end. I wouldn't say that his theorizing had any effect. He himself was a consultant and had some influence on, um, I could say, a number of individuals, my boss, John McNaughton, and a few others, Henry Kissinger even. But as a personal person, it wasn't his theorizing that had the effect. The idea that game theory had an influence is a mistake on the whole, and uh, or that it should have had, I would say. It wasn't suited for it. Tom Schelling's kind of theorizing was relatively relevant uh, to what you could call two-person or n-person non-zero-sum games, that notion 
his theories of bargaining and threats were uh, relevant, and and in some cases could potentially have been very good on arms control, for example. Yeah. But there they weren't applied. Yeah. Uh, where he where they were applied to some extent was not very favorable. He, for example, in his later years, at the time he got the Nobel Prize, was very uh, optimistic about low risks of nuclear war. I think he was mistaken in that. I guess one last question is, um, it can be easy, I think, to, to be a bit demoralized because this problem doesn't seem easy to solve, that the institutions that create this risk are, are somewhat yeah. resistant to reform. Like, what, what is it that gives you kind of uh, hope that it's uh, yeah, <laughs> worth working on? And I guess what, what, what well, can help motivate people to, to work? just the other day, hope is not a feeling, it's a way of acting. <laughs> yeah. I know that what looks impossible uh, is, is something you should never be confident of because good things that looked impossible, like the ending of the Berlin Wall or the ending of the first Cold War, looked impossible, not just unlikely, in that period of time. And they did happen, uh, thanks to Gorbachev and anti-nuclear movements and various things. The idea that Norm that Mandela would come to power in North Africa without a violent revolution didn't look unlikely. It looked impossible, and it did happen. So to say that we can't get out of this, you know, there's no good basis for that. We don't know the future that well. I can say, as in those cases, I can't see the way in which it will happen. But that's what I would have, what anyone would have said about the downing of the Berlin Wall. How is that going to come about? It's not going to come about, but it did. And so to say that, the, the stakes are very high for continuing to try to explore and to try to challenge the obstacles that we can see in the way of that happening, like the role of, and this is new for me, the role not just of the Air Force, but of the corporations that, uh, and, the, and the budget process. How do you affect that? I don't know. But is, I wouldn't say it was impossible. It was done, as you say, in the case of tobacco companies domestically. And everything is at stake. Everything is at stake. So we're talking now about properly called existential crises now and dangers that simply did not exist before. You could say, by the way, I'm just, just at the top of my head, a kind of epidemic that would destroy was probably possible in some sense. But bringing it about, you know, the genetic engineering that we're working on right now, that was not possible then. Should we have been uh, equally concerned about uh, bioweapons during the Cold War as, as, as we were about nuclear weapons? Uh, yeah, is there a good chance that they could have also led to led to human extinction? And how worried are you about uh, bioweapons today c compared to nuclear weapons? We now know, only recently, big book on this by Milton Leitenberg and others on the Soviet biological warfare program and chemical warfare program. Brezhnev was sure that when Nixon signed the Convention Against Biological Warfare, that he would continue a covert program on a large scale, and so they had to have one too. Now, what's the use of doing that if you don't use it deterrently, if you don't make it public? How can it be a deterrent? It can't. But then how could they say, we're assuming you're breaking this, so we're breaking it too. You couldn't prove that Nixon was doing it. And amazingly enough, Nixon wasn't doing it, as far as we can tell. They did preserve some smallpox at CIA and some anthrax and this and that, but only a refrigerator full, sort of. The Russians maintain vats, are you aware, of hundreds of thousands of gallons and pounds of anthrax and botulinus and uh, improved forms, uh, you know, against vaccines, of these things. Now, that's as close to insanity and evil as you can come to. As one uh, disarmer said when he looked at a huge vat that had been made for anthrax, he said, I'm looking at pure evil. Well, fair enough, it would seem so. Who continued that? Uh, it was done under Brezhnev, kept very secret, as far as we know, was not revealed. It is strange, love, you know, and kept secret, not for deterrent. Continued under Gorbachev. Now, how could Gorbachev possibly continue this insane evil program? He told Larry Brilliant, who had been instrumental in eliminating smallpox from the world, when Brilliant asked him, and I have my, a, a memoir about Brilliant on this, he talked to Gorbachev and he said, how could you have done this? We were eliminating smallpox. You were providing huge amounts of smallpox here. Gorbachev got very disturbed, anxious, uneasy, you know, anguished. 
and said he knew it was the most he was most ashamed of that of anything he'd ever been involved in he said the military came to me and said if you don't continue this you cannot stay in office you know we will overthrow you and he looked at all the things he was doing reducing nuclear weapons glasnost opening up the society and all that and rather than give all that up he continued this insane program which is very human very normal that's not to excuse it it was horrible it was culpable and yet that was the choice he made like castro and the others it's what most americans would have done and kept it secret okay so uh, when you look at that kind of behavior by gorbachev i think the most the person most influential for good that i can think of in the last century my hero so far but nobody's perfect and not just imperfect this was horribly imperfect okay but in a very natural way for humans to do in power when you look at that human characteristic it's hard to be confident humans will survive to me it's crazy to be confident i have to say to think that it's highly likely we will survive nuclear weapons the climate change artificial intelligence genetic engineering biological warfare to be confident like that is to be either totally ignorant which is true of most people in that respect to be unaware of the nature to be ignorant of the nature of humanity which most people are or to be crazy or to be hired by you know to be corrupt and hired by people who make this stuff and uh, so decide it's like working for a tobacco company probably a lot of them manage to believe that it's not carcinogenic that's hard to believe isn't it but uh, it's not hard for me to believe that there are tobacco executives who think this is all a witch hunt they've convinced them so you can believe anything that your job depends on but uh how about being thinking it's likely will survive i can't believe that i think it's unlikely very unlikely but not impossible and i don't believe it's impossible i don't have confidence in possible i don't i don't think that my age and experience doesn't permit me to be confident that there's no way out here because humans are adaptable and things do change and the ones i mentioned are possible we are on the titanic going at full speed on a moonless night into iceberg waters have we hit the iceberg yet and made it inevitable that this will go down we don't know it may turn out that a while ago we went past the no return point but we don't know that there's no way to prove it as i say in the book i propose i do act as if we had a chance to find our way out of this and i don't know what it is yet but that doesn't tell me there is no way so i i urge others i encourage them and if they if they give up or or, or devote themselves entirely to pleasure let's say in their life like being on the titanic and drinking the champagne uh after they've hit the iceberg i can't say that's crazy or even culpable but i don't join that and if they stop trying to save the world and just try to ease the pain of some other people or you know help help people in some way i think that's very reasonable very good and i just think that it's it is definitely not wasted for some of us to keep trying to explore to see if there's a way out of this. My guest today has been Daniel Lesberg. Thanks for coming <laughs> on the podcast, Daniel. Thank you for the opportunity. I hope you enjoyed listening to that. Again, if you know a community that could benefit from finding out about this episode, please do pass it on to them. As I said at the top of the show, I'll now read a blog post we recently released, which seems pretty relevant to nuclear security careers, for at least some listeners anyway. If it doesn't sound relevant to you, don't feel any need to listen to it. I'm undecided on whether this should be a regular feature of the program or how much we should make audio versions of articles in the 80,000 Hours website in general. And if you'd like to share your thoughts on this, email us at podcast at 80,000hours.org. The 80,000 Hours podcast is produced by Kieran Harris. Thanks for joining. Talk to you in a week or two. American with a PhD or computer science master's? Get a fast track into AI and STEM policy by applying for the acclaimed AAAS Science and Technology Fellowship by November 1. Written by Neil Bowerman, published September 18th, 2018. Within just four years of finishing her PhD in biophysics, Jessica Tuchman Matthews was Director of Global Issues for President Carter's National Security Council. In her first year in the role, she helped put together a nuclear non-proliferation pact among 15 countries, including the US and the Soviet Union. Later in her career, Jessica served as Deputy to the Under Secretary of State for Global Affairs, wrote a weekly column for the Washington Post, and most recently served as president of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. 
an influential Washington-based foreign policy think tank. What launched such a successful career? In our conversation with Jessica, she argued it was the AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellowship. Jessica was selected as one of their inaugural fellows in 1973. In this article, we argue that for US citizens with PhDs or CS masters interested in our top recommended problem areas and science and technology policy careers, the AAAS s and Policy Fellowship is a valuable springboard which could rapidly advance your career as it did for Jessica. Summary. At 80,000 hours, we think the AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellowship is one of the best routes into US science and technology policy careers. AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellows are highly regarded within the US government. If you're a US citizen with a STEM or social science PhD or a computer science master's and three years of industry experience, you can apply here. We'd also like to hear from you for potential coaching. The deadline for applications is the 1st of November. The opportunity in brief. At 80,000 hours, we think the AAAS Policy Fellowship is one of the best routes into the US government for people with a STEM or social science PhD or a computer science master's and three years of industry experience. Policy fellows work within the US government for one year in policy-related roles relevant to science and technology. As we'll show later in the article, AAAS policy fellows have a good reputation in government. The fellowship has been running for over 40 years and attracts high-galloper scientists and engineers interested in policy. Applicants come from a range of backgrounds, including early to late career researchers, but also people who have left research to work in industry or for the nonprofit sector. Government officers are often keen to hire AAAS policy fellows because of the expertise they bring to government. Jessica Tuchman Matthews described how in her day it was a wonderful calling card, a sentiment that was echoed by others we spoke with. This makes the fellowship among the best routes we've found into US government science and technology policy careers. We think that these careers offer a substantial opportunity to contribute to policymaking on a range of issues from artificial intelligence to biosecurity and from ending factory farming to ending extreme poverty. We are particularly excited about people with advanced degrees in subjects relevant to machine learning entering government. The way AI is handled by governments is likely to shape this technology's development, which in turn could impact humanity's long-term trajectory. We outline our views on why we think AI public policy careers are particularly impactful in this linked article. In the following sections, we'll go into more detail about how the fellowship works and its pros and cons. More detail on how the fellowship works. Nearly 300 fellows are accepted each year, and almost all of them take assignments within the executive branch, for example in the departments of defense and state or within the intelligence community. A small handful of fellows work in Congress or within the judiciary. To be eligible, you must be a US citizen with a PhD in a STEM or social or behavioral science subject. Engineers with an engineering master's degree and a minimum of three years of industry experience are also eligible. When we inquired, AAAS said that people with a computer science master's from an engineering school would be eligible if they had at least three years of industry experience. If you have several years of experience in the technology sector, then you could also consider the Tech Congress Fellowship. Fellows receive a stipend of $80,000 to $105,000, as well as other support including health insurance, a travel stipend, and a year-long professional development program. For more information about the fellowship, read AAAS's FAQ. Potential benefits. The fellowship seems to offer a significant boost in career capital in just one year, especially for those who want to focus on issues relevant to global catastrophic risks. This section outlines some of the reasons why. During your AAAS s and Policy Fellowship, it is usually possible to serve in more senior roles in government than you might have otherwise been offered. This is in large part because of the fellowship's prestige within government, which is probably helped by its competitive application process and the positive reputation of past fellows. The AAAS s and Policy Fellowship boasts a 3,000-person alumni network. Some of the most impressive mid-career policymakers we know at 80,000 hours were once AAAS s and Policy Fellows. Having a network within government that spans departments is also valuable for helping get things done. The fellowship has an impressive placement record. The fellowship FAQ gives some statistics. In the year immediately following their fellowship, approximately 40 to 50% of fellows continue working in the policy realm, though not necessarily in federal government. 20 to 25% return to the sector in which they worked previously, and 20 to 25% use the experience as a stepping stone to a new opportunity. Compared with most other US government fellows, the AAAS s and Policy Fellowship is more relevant to those attempting to improve the long-term future because of its focus on science and technology policy. Potential downsides. If there is a reasonably large chance that you will want to return to academia after the policy fellowship, then spending a year in government may make that harder. In general, once you leave academia, it can be difficult to return. A similar argument may apply if you're thinking of returning to non-academic research after the fellowship. In this case, it will probably be better to do research-related work instead of this fellowship. After the year of the fellowship, you do not have a job in government by default. You will need to use the network that you develop over the course of the year to find a position in your second year. On occasion, it is possible, however, to extend the fellowship to a second year at the mutual agreement of the host office, AAAS, and yourself. You do not have complete control over which parts of government you end up working in. 
Placements are allocated by agreement between AAAS, the host, departments and agencies, and applicants. You do not know which office you'll be placed with until the end of the process. The application process for the fellowship is somewhat involved. In addition to the usual references and online application, you'll be required to write a policy memo and present it in a video interview. Near the end of the process, there are also in-person interviews in DC with potential placement officers. The application process is also relatively competitive, though AAAS does not release information on the fraction of applicants that are actually accepted. Conclusion. If you're a US citizen with a PhD or CS Masters, we think certain areas of science and technology policy are among your highest impact career paths. The AAAS Fellowship is one of the best ways to launch a career in US science and technology policy, and we strongly encourage you to consider applying. The annual deadline is November 1st. We're particularly interested to meet with potential applicants with PhDs or CS Masters who are interested in working in one of our priority paths, such as AI policy. If you fit this description, please get in touch below and we may be able to make introductions, help advise on how to apply, and provide career guidance.